Steve, where the hell are you, man? We got a show to do. I'm getting there. Oh my god. When do we, when do we go on? Oh, I don't... Have we started the in intro yet? Did we ever leave the last show? Uh, I don't know. Uh, hi. Oh, we're on? I think we're on, man. Are we on? Uh... Let's see. Uh, oh. Hello? <laughs> hello? Hello? <laughs> Mueller? <laughs> oh. Okay. Ooh, look. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have sound? Oh my god. Do we have people patiently Jeez. waiting. Yeah, it looks like we have sound. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Come for the knowledge. Stay for being held up at the altar. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey. How's it going, man? I so I think that I just think I think just we just should just admit and own that we're never going to have our shit together. We're no. always going to be pulling stuff out of our ass at the last thirty minutes, and that's just the that's just the way it is. Some things don't ever change. Oh, I like this. Uh. We moved the mic because you asked said it for was it. stupid where it was before, and now it's stupid so now, um, where it is. Uh, but if it sounds good, y'all, then uh, let us know. Otherwise, um, we're uh, we're here. We're here. We're and, here. Uh, and and, uh, and John, I love your comment. And yeah, I was um, I was gonna do my geisha girl outfit. Um, uh, I have the the wig, the whole the kimono, and the little hairpiece with the with the uh, umbrella on it, the parasol, and the whole bit. But we couldn't find it. Oh, well, seriously? Yeah, the last time I wore it was about 20 years ago, when Halloween landed on a weekday. It was like a Thursday or something around. Oh, I remember seeing a picture of that. Yeah, there's a picture of it somewhere, and the glorious part of it was. Uh, UPS had just sent some reps over to the factory to show us their new user-friendly, sophisticated shipping software that was going to really make life a dream for us setting up shipments in our shipping department. Yeah. A, you know, importing the addresses and the invoices and just make it all really seamless. Yeah. Uh -huh. And of course, it didn't work and it took a week to get the right version installed and tech support and all this kind of stuff and we screwed around with it for a good solid week and two reps from ups showed up at the factory on that thursday oh really and hey well so we got you all set up with your new software how's it all working and i get in the guy's face and i go it cost us four days of shipping downtime it never worked right. We don't know if it's going to continue to work right. It doesn't interface with our printers. Why don't you guys get your shit together? I mean, look, we've... It's not we've, like you're the malcontent. We've cooperated with you. We've done everything that you said. We paid the, the money. We did everything that you said, and it's still not working. Are you going to deliver a working system by the end of the day today so we can ship? And I'm just, like, giving the guy up one side and down the other and and then and I said and I'll be right back and I had to run to the can uh, to to relieve myself and I go in the can and I look in the mirror and I went oh shh <laughs> I'm just completely stone faced pissed <laughs> and I've got this ridiculous wig and kimono on and my face is all pasty white with little red lips and the uh, the parasol <laughs> sticking out of my wig and I went what an asshole. <laughs> and I went back out and I looked at the guys and they were standing there just like, what the hell <laughs> just happened? They're probably still telling that story. I'm sure they are. Uh, oh man, I felt like an ass. That was me last night. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's, uh, who do you look like? You look like the, you look like the guy in uh, um, Midnight Oil. <laughs> A cross between him and, and the and the ghosted dude. 
Oh, nice. Very nice. Yes. I was. Are you going to share? Oh, should I share? Of course you should. Yeah. Oh. Halloween. Oh, oh, oh. Party. Focus. Oh. This is oh. awesome. Ah. Oh, I, I think I have to. Yeah. Cover no your face. Eyes. Yeah. I do it. I'm the. Uh, the oh. Did you make it work? Without the hood. Oh. Yeah. Tis I! That was fun. Check this one out. Get my face out of there. Was this from the day? Yeah, yeah. Pull out a little bit so it's bigger. There, go, go in closer so it's bigger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, baby. See the little parasol sticking out of the top on the side there? Yeah. So was this before or after your uh, your episode with UPS? That was what I was wearing when I was ripping the guy. That's what I mean, but was the picture taken before? It was after? taken before, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, man, that rules. Oh, look, because we're, we're, we're uh, time traveling here, I got my Doc Brown, my orange... Doc Brown <laughs> vandals. So we hop in the DeLorean and go. Uh, oh, everybody about. says it sounds good. Good, good. It sounds good. Steve Vai, I saw Steve Vai the other day. The power amps were plenty loud. And you know what? And he runs them on 60 watt mode. And he doesn't actually have them very loud at all. It's, 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 it's mic'd, you know, and it, the, the volume is from the house. Wayne, Wayne, what game are you watching before you go? If you didn't already go. And, uh,. What game are you watching, and who's your team? That's that's all I want to know. My team actually finally won today in <laughs> London. Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> or road maps. That's right. That's right. We just need... So how are you feeling? I don't know. I'm... Yeah, I know. I'm you, still, I'm still mentally running. I went to bed at 3, I think, 3 or 3.30. Um, I feel good. I don't I, feel horrible. I was going to go. I was going to go to the factory yesterday and and pull. Uh, I was actually going to go to the warehouse, the storage warehouse, and pull this stuff out yesterday. But um, we have got so much back order level to fill that we ended up working all day yesterday. And I'm all through the Saturday. All through Saturday. I mean. There's just the amount of stuff that the amount the amount of stuff that we're shipping this that we shipped last week and the week before and that we're going to ship in the next week. If I brought anybody like from Fender or Marshall or any other amp company in and said these people did all of this in the three weeks, they would like, yeah, bullshit. They would yeah. not. They would not believe it. Yeah. And no, no person would believe it. I don't know how we do it but uh, somehow we managed and um so i went i decided well i can go do it today i can go do it the next day and um well yesterday was officially our 27th anniversary and so we went out for dinner last night and and i and uh we we drank we drank some champagne, and then we drank some wine, and then we drank some port, and then we drank some more wine, and um, so by the time I got out of the warehouse, I still had plenty of time, although I had to crawl up shelves and find these things. You did mention it was probably going to be an ordeal. It was an ordeal, but the thing that took longer than I... I mean, I figured... The thing that took longer than I, than I expected was getting the original 2150 prototype up and running, and we'll get into that later. But yeah, that was yeah. that was a that was that just took more time. Uh, I'm glad I took the time. It was an adventure, and it was fun, and uh, it was literally the first time since eight, 1989. The first time it's been turned on. That's bananas. Because once it was built. Well, we'll get into that, but uh, that's the first time that we turned it on, and it's got the original tubes in it that were in it when it was made. Yeah. And uh, uh, 
so it just took a little it just took a little time yeah i don't know what i've seen that freezing happen a little bit um are they seizing, seeing it yeah it, it's it's uh yeah, Jim says the video keeps freezing. When the video freezes, does the audio freeze at the same time, guys? Or is it just the video feed? And uh, Green Bay and, uh, and, Thanks, and Carlos. Buffalo. Cool. Thanks, guys. That's probably an interesting matchup. And yeah, Russell has been abducted by an alien. Yeah, well, Jim, I wanted to do this this show in that outfit. But like I said, we didn't know where it was and didn't have time. I mean, that literally, hey, that took me... 2023 20, goals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Halloween 2023. That's a 100% that's legit traditional Japanese kimono. I'm sure. With all the stuff. I'm and sure. And that whole outfit took me four hours to get to put on. Wow. So, um, audio's good to go. Audio's fine. It just, it just once in a while the video freezes and then it comes back. My that, that might be a, shouldn't be a camera temperature issue. But it could be. I might turn the camera off and back on just to reset it. If it keeps happening, let us know. Um, then, it, then all of a sudden it'll be a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> just have an audio feed and that'll be it. So, you so everybody out there doing fine. Everybody doing all right. I see some cool comments already that I want to respond to. You want to talk about the Packers-Bills game? Uh, you're all over that. I know you're all over. You're that. gonna have to talk about that because I. <laughs> what, what I know about Packers, so we're not gonna discuss on this show. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about the current quarterback. We'll talk about Aaron Rodgers. It's Aaron Rodgers and Josh Allen. Is that a basketball team? <laughs> or some some 1970s pop duo? I mean, this guy. This guy, Packers. we're not even drinking yet. Packers. Yeah, your Raiders are done, dude. You were done when you hired McDaniels. That's, and I know because we had him ten years ago. It was the worst thing that ever happened to the franchise. Oh, you're doing great. The nine, yeah, uh, I, yeah, he needed to go before he was hired. Actually, he's bad news. <laughs> uh, all right. So, so you said there's. See, well, my there. my my sport of choice these days. And uh, we didn't do a big celebration last night. We just had a nice dinner and some drinks. We're going to uh, we're going to Japan uh, next month, and we're going to really celebrate our 27th then. But thanks for the kind wishes. That is so cool. And um, we're going to do it upright. So I think you leave the day that I go see Elton John play his last gig ever at Dodger Stadium. Dodger Stadium is a 20th. good place to see a, to see a, a live show, and that that'll be a great show. I can walk from to Dodger Stadium from my place. We saw. Um, we saw ACDC. At Dodgers. At the Dodger Stadium. Chavez Ravine. Yeah, that the 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 last one before. Um, Brian Johnson bailed. Yeah. Yeah, and oh my god. Before you got Welcome to the Jungle? It was the loudest, and I'm not even exaggerating, it was the loudest show I've ever attended, and I've been to Slade live at the Paramount. <laughs> Slade, what in year? In Seattle. That what was the about 73. <clears throat> wow. Um, they were so loud. Well, the Paramount is, is a movie theater, so I mean, it wasn't a huge venue. And they were just on. And they were, they overpowered that place so bad that the best place to listen to them was out on the, out in the front, yeah. the sidewalk in the front of the place. Uh, and it sounded amazing. But you went in and the Naughty, Naughty's voice has got that, that chainsaw, powered chainsaw oh, yeah. quality to he it. He was and ahead when, of his time in terms of. And when of, you uh, got the PA, a really good quality PA, which Paramount did add a. Probably still does <coughs> great sound system. <coughs> it was literally like just having your head sawn off. It was so loud. But at Dodger Stadium with ACDC, I was standing where the uh, console, I was standing next to the sound man. How the hell did you do that? Well, knew a couple of people. Okay. Got in. So we stood behind the soundboard. No earplugs? 
earplugs and putting my fingers in my ears, and it was still too loud. Whoa. In fact, my fingers hurt after the show from pressing my earplugs into my ears. Okay, that's... It was brutal. And, and still my ears were That's ringing. not even reasonable. It was beyond unreasonable. I, the guys, the people sitting, you know, in the back of the stadium, it was probably perfect for them. But yeah, no. but for the rest of everyone. And the sound guy, he's not wearing earplugs. He's not like... He's just got his hand on the fader like this, and he's just... <laughs> he's just squinting intently at the band and he's got his fingers like this on the main faders and between his two fingers he's got a big blunt <laughs> and he's just like this and he died shortly thereafter oh my god so you want to answer this question by uh from our buddy lucas <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah, about a year after the 2150 came out, uh, uh, Kasha copied it, sort of copied it, not a great copy. Um, and and uh, um, they showed up at the NAMM show with what they were claiming was the best power amp in the world, the most unique and innovative you know, design and all that. And so me and some buddies, we went over to their booth and said, yeah, we heard all about this really innovative power amp. We wanted to check it out. And, he would not look at me. He turns away and he walks. And, you know, so we had... It was, yeah, it was kind of like he looked straight ahead. And I was with there with a couple of friends that were, were watching the, the presentation and all that. Were they holding baseball bats behind you? Uh, no, no, no. It was just like we were just there just to, just to vibe the plays, you know, in our usual cocky way, you know. But, I mean, hey... It's like when you rip off a design, okay? I have a, I have a picture ready to go of you from that era. Can I? Sure, the, the sure. People? So this is what Steve would have essentially looked like <laughs> uh, during that time period. Uh, oh my God. Yeah. Have hair. Yeah, hard to tell how much purple is in my hair in that picture, but you yeah. Yeah, a bunch of purple. Yeah, that's that's the first prototype, and that's my 1970 JMP. Um, and that's my the the bedroom, the second bedroom in my new apartment I had just moved to to set up a factory in the bedroom. Um, because I was sharing an apartment with. Let's a talk about those jeans for a moment. Well, what's to talk about? Uh, everything. It's like you, you invented, you, you uh, innovated and, and uh, well, this is renovated. This is 88. I mean, that's... so you, you had some air conditioning going there. Oh, like that's... you're, you're in the valley and you're like, these are pretty warm. I need some air vents. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what that, we... so what you're holding there, that first prototype is actually sitting behind us right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So we went in there, and of course we had our display. We had the several different colors of power amps. We had the purple one, the blue one, the red one, and the black one. Okay. And the Kasha ones were all black with purple silk screen, red silk screen, no. blue silk screen, and white silk screen. Man, they couldn't so even do something. Uh, their yeah, own he did. Wouldn't do. Design. He did do colored anodizers. He did different colors. Of printing on yeah. a black panel, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, his also. I don't think it had handles on it. But the main thing was, he p copied the circuit mostly. But he used uh, the transformers weren't as good. And I know because I worked on one. Uh, he also <laughs> these used toroid power transformers, and his use did not use toroid power transformers. Okay. So they didn't have that that punchy presence that a real 2150 had, but, you know, he was only one of several uh, that, that, uh, but so, uh, that it, were copying that. It, it sounds like uh, if you had a caution, you could actually, not that difficult, like bring it up to 2150 spec, no? Well, you'd have to change the, at that time, $50 transformer for a $200 toroid, 
mm. a locally made one, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was about a $200 transformer at the time. And the, uh, the front panel uh, was just a, a grained anodized black panel that they weren't expensive. What we had was a CNC machined etched, you know, the, 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 the lettering is all engraved into the metal. Yeah. You know, and then hand filled by a biker friend of mine who was really into pinstriping. He was a pinstriping expert. Oh, so he cool. did all the, he did all the white, it's a V-shaped groove that, that's where the logo is engraved, right? Yeah. So in order to paint the inside of that, he would, he had this little V-shaped piece of paper and he would pour the paint into this piece of paper and pull it along the groove as he's pouring the paint in there. Okay. And it would, it would run down the sides of the groove to fill it white. And if he poured it too fast, the paint would build up on the bottom and start bubbling because the air would start to break out of it and then he would have to rinse it and start over again and if he didn't pour it fast enough it would it would dry too soon as it's going down and it wouldn't make it all the way down the groove right. so it was a science that's and also like having a so that was a, a, a $200 panel versus a $50 panel so yeah. basically he knocked quite a bit of cost out the real fun part about the JK150 look around the chassis the guy that owns it, what's that, Lucas. Lucas? Look around the chassis, you'll probably see that there's some holes in there that don't have screws in it because the holes don't line up. I thought that was cute that he shipped them that way. Oh, interesting. But uh, yeah, we need to get this out of the marketplace. We're not even gonna bother fixing the engineering and make the screw holes line up. Yeah. But maybe he fixed that later, I don't know. But the ones I saw, they didn't have all the screws installed because the holes didn't match. What about this? One side of a twenty-one fifty going out. Did you know? Did you ever work with Ken? Um, Ken Andrews from the band Failure used a twenty-one fifty with his library, but complained one side would always go out. Was this common? Was there a fix? Um, one of the things that people did um, oh, frequently so was not pay attention to the uh, the output impedance and. This power amp is running a pair of KT88s per side at their maximum potential. So the impedance has to be strictly observed. I actually have uh, I have a cassette in a drawer someplace. I think I might have stumbled across it a few weeks ago. A cassette out of an answering machine. Uh-huh. And... Um, on the cassette is a nasty message from the guitar player from uh, uh, one of the L.A. hair metal bands oh, okay. of the time. And he's just ranting and raving about his amp kept conking out. A power amp or his, an amp? A, a 2150 power oh, 20, amp. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had that. We had a similar problem with with James, uh, 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 Allison Chains. The guy in this other band, whose name I can't remember right at the moment. Uh, I think it was the band that is it Stewart on Beavis and Butthead that had the the T-shirt with the not Winger. It was Winger. So was it Reb Beach? Was was giving you the the stuff? Cause was it Winger? I don't, I don't remember who. Because Red, like, is such a nice no, guy. Uh, anyway, this, this guy called and just raved and ranted and fumed about his amp kept coming out, kept conking out. He had the amp set to 16 ohms on each side, and he was running three uh, crate 8 ohm 412s per side. So he had three ohms worth of speakers on each side in the 16 ohm setting and he had it turned up pretty loud so yes the tubes would fail when you did that um and i was uh uh i <coughs> we were having a problem with alice and chains and their power amps and i just happened to be in seattle when they were when they were performing uh it was during the holidays and i went into the club during soundtrack and they were running the amp at 16 ohm at 
the amp set to 16 ohms and the the amp set to 8 ohms and the cabinets were at 16. So, uh, and they were pushing them hard too. So yes, that would cause the tubes to fail. They sent us the amp mm -hmm. and we retubed it and put new screen resistors in it, which when the screen, screen resistors go, that means you're running at the wrong impedance at full volume. So that was a pretty, pretty obvious. Ooh. Oh my gosh. Ooh. What I do we got here? I'm lucky. So, um. Kentucky coffee, not the Irish coffee. Kentucky, Kentucky coffee? coffee. What's Kentucky coffee? I saw the, like, the Makers. Makers 46. Ooh. Ooh. Makers 46 with you ground that coffee. I think you roasted the beans. I roasted the beans. I ground it and then, yeah. So you, you roasted the beans. You ground the beans. Mm -hmm. You made the coffee. Mm -hmm. And you made your own whipped cream. Yeah, I would. Because nobody's fucking around here. <laughs> this is insane, man. Uh, so this is a, a, a Kentucky coffee. A Kentucky coffee. Cheers. Maybe, uh, Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, Erico. Uh, right. You're Erico right now. You're not uh, 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 Nico Chan. Nico oh. What? You want this? I was just thinking that I needed a coffee because uh, I've been, we've been running like batshit crazy for the past <sighs> week, but I wasn't expecting this. This is great. Um, so, so I went up there and I said, so how's everything going with the power? He says, oh, it's working actually pretty good right now. We just got it a few days ago and it's, it's been working pretty good so far. And uh, I said, did you see my notice that I put on it? And he goes, notice? When we shipped it back to them, we put a big yellow piece of paper on it with red lettering. It said there is bubble wrap inside the amp securing the tube so they don't get damaged <laughs> in shipping. So please remove that before installing in the rack. <laughs> they didn't read it. They just put the thing in the rack with the notice, with the bubble wrap, and did a show. And the bubble wrap was all melted over the outside of the tooth, but it was still working fine. And I just went, you guys, I give up. This, that's Beavis and Butthead worthy. Yeah, it was really Beavis and Butthead worthy. What about... Uh... But I, did, I didn't introduce myself at the time. I was just in there standing backstage during the day during sound check and the guitar tech comes up and he's and i said oh i noticed you're using a 2150 what's that what's that stuff coming out of the back of it he goes i don't know what does it look like and i said looks like melted plastic or something and he goes ah oh. and i said what's that little there's a piece of yellow paper looks like some kind of sign and he goes oh i don't know and i said and, and you're running it at eight ohms into 16 ohm cabinets is that okay to do that and he goes oh yeah the engineer the, the sound engineer said that's the way you should run it <laughs> And I said, no, I, it's a 16 ohm cab. You should, that's why it's got a switch. You should set it to 16. He goes, how do you know so much about this? I said, uh, well, I kind of designed it. <laughs> and he goes, he kind of, his face went white. And I said, I'm not here to give you a hard time. I just want it to work right. So can you yeah. guys please run it the right way so I don't have to hear about it anymore? And right. he's like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. Ah! And I, I, I kind of pulled that. I wanted to get his attention before... I wasn't trying to lay down like I'm, you know, like I came here specifically to give you shit. I just wanted to find out what was really going on first. So I kind of kept it on the down low. And then when I told him who I was, he was like, oh, oh man, oh, that's I funny. got spanked. That's funny. So, yeah, there was a bit of that. On the on the other hand. Want to do Use that. Oh, man, we have more goodness coming tonight. We're in trouble. Uh, on the, But... Big Mars never had a problem with his. Steve I never had a problem with his. Lukather never had a problem with his. Uh, uh, DeLeo, never a problem. Uh, Mike Landau, never a problem. You know, most of the guys, 80% of the guys didn't have a, have a problem. It was only the guys that had roadies that considered themselves electrical geniuses that didn't really know how to make chains and that's they're, where they're the, bro from they're, their hometown like, yeah, that's, that's, where, that's where the problems really <laughs> came in the other fun thing was that um when we made the transition from the original design to the to the later one which happened like six months later or it was released a year after the original one was that they had more headroom and therefore more dynamic range and therefore 
not we're, as squishy and well it wasn't so much that but it was the, the the phase inverter was no longer running at its limit so yeah it would compress a little less and it would it, it also oh because you changed you had the the marshall phase inverter yeah thing going in the yeah early ones right yeah so um once that version came out we started having a couple of guys blow the output tubes, and it turned out that the year that that model came out was the same year Marshall Cabinet came out with the impedance switch on the back of it, mm. the stereo mono switch, yeah. that you set it one way and use one jack and it's four ohms, and you set it the other way and use another jack and it's 16 ohm, and if you use both of them, it's, it's stereo, right? right? So, great except it was a slide switch and not a very good one. So if you really put low end into that cab, mm -hmm. and if you guys know anything about, <laughs> if you know anything about, uh, about uh, Marshall cabs, they have a, a center post inside, yeah. and the back cover is just resting on that post. Mm -hmm. So if you really pound low into it, the back oh, yeah. will bang against that post. Yeah. That post is right next to that little switch. Yeah. And so if you start hitting it with low end, it, that post will bang against the back and cause the switch to make and break contact. That's so bananas. And because we tried to make the thing blow up to find out why other people were making them blow up mm. to the point where we put a one kilohertz square wave into both channels into two 412 cabinets at full volume in the shop and then stood 10 feet away and I threw a ball peen hammer directly at the tubes <laughs> to try to get the board, the PCBs to arc. You're, you're like, uh, oh. what, what was that show? And it, it, it blew the fuses, but it didn't damage the guts of the amp. Um, <laughs> so I went, okay, the... what's going on here? And then uh, a, one guy who was just like notoriously blowing tubes because of, because of that, I said, bring your cabinet in. And he brought the cabinet in and he demonstrated it. And then I went, looked at the back and I saw this switch and I went, we devised a test where you could play it just loud enough to hear that switch going <coughs> just loud enough to get it to do it without blowing the fuse. And then I held my hand on the back of the cabinet and it stopped doing that. Hmm. So the fix was we put a screw in the back of the cap right in the middle where that sound post was and it stopped the problem. That's... I think we put a little bit of silicone uh, sealant on the switch too so that the, the switch slider wouldn't vibrate. But what was that show? Uh, that that stopped it? after once once we addressed that, we never had any problems with it again. Well, you have another question. Good evening, Minnesota. Nice to have you here. You guys are like. But well, look, Steve. Now you need. Now you're on the. You're on the hook. Ooh. Other than STP, what other signature guitar tones can be attributed to 2150? Ugh! I just named a bunch. Um, I saw a great picture of, of Paige Hamilton's original rig the other day. Yeah. I was digging through some photos for you to do this, and uh, I saw his rig. He had two ultra leads, two 2150s, and four 412 cabs. He was using all of it. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the helmet rig, that's... the pretty big sonic footprint. Well, I think it's um, interesting that we not only saw guys like Landau and, and, and Luke using them, but like uh, like Dave Mustaine always had one yeah. in his rack. Yeah, I think. and he was very very down low about it. He wouldn't wouldn't really talk about it. Ah. Uh, and... Uh, but it was always there. And, uh, and um, uh, Metallica was using 2150s. They used mm. them on the Black Album. Did Vernon and they Reed hit have them. a 2150? Huh? Did Vernon Reed have a 2150? He had three. Oh, okay. So that's a yes. He really put us on the map. He had a red one. How many red ones did you make? Uh, we didn't make that many. Were they one of just the very early ones? Or yeah. did you did you make them beyond that first like batch no. of a hundred? Mm -mm. So he had one of what he had one of the ones with the with the Marshall phase inverter. Yeah. And and, and then he's then he got another uh, two more of the later version. Ah, did did uh, he ever talk to you about uh, noticing differences? No. Uh. -uh. Interesting. No, he was he was more about 
he was more about the the reliability thing. He was just like, yeah, they sound great, and, and they're they're holding together. We're on the road blah, blah, blah. all the time, and just yeah. thank you. We went to, when they were in L.A. They were playing at the Palladium in Hollywood, and uh, on the Palladium, the stage is about five feet off the floor, and has a little ledge on the front of it. And while I was talking to Vernon about his rig and what we could do to trim it up and stuff, his rack that had um, it had a Mesa 300 power amp, I think, whatever their fourth base one was, had a Mesa power amp in it and a 2150 in it. And it was rolling towards the edge of the stage and nobody noticed it, we're yakking away. When it hit the edge of the stage, it hit that ledge and tipped over and landed on the floor five feet down, oh, yeah, face down, yeah. and um, and the 2150 was still working, and, the, and, the, and the, the other one, the chassis broke away from the front panel, and all the tubes broke in it, and, and he just looked, he looked at the rack, and he looked at me, and smiled, he goes, I guess I'll need another one of those VHDs, he was, he was a very low-key guy, he wasn't, Vernon's awesome, he wasn't super demonstrative, he was just like, hey, yeah, it's, it's cool, man. It's working for me kind of guy. Yeah. I liked him. Uh, I, we keep saying we, it'd be great to have him on the show. Yeah. Well, he just signed on as a Laney artist now, so that might complicate things, but we'll see. I think he'd just come on and talk even non-gear. Yeah. Vernon's just a great, great, great hang yeah. conversationalist. Yeah. Does, does this, I, I don't, I don't understand this question, but you might, does this, Not do it because I keep having a weird feedback. Okay, uh, Braxel, fifty watt what? I have the fifty. I have the fifty watt and tried to capture my seventy two fifty watt. So what are you talking about? Are you talking about a PS two? And uh, let's let's get a little bit. Vernon had two huge racks. He had two 18 space racks that were chock full of everything that you could cram in there. Power station. I come on, third time and you'll get it right. <laughs> John, I'm <laughs> power station po power That's okay, Brett. I'm just giving you shit. I know you can spell power station. Thanks. Um All right, so let's go back squeal. The first time I just go to um, Google Fryet squeal videos. Oh, I did those. On, I made a couple of those. On YouTube. <laughs> and that will explain the squeal. I hardly remember. I just remember doing some experimentation. Yeah. Like, let's get some squeal. There are two going. scenarios in which it will squeal. One is proximity, you're standing too close. Transformer proximity. Yeah. yeah. And the other one is ground loop stuff. And Joe does a great job of explaining it and demonstrating <clears throat> what causes that and what you can do to get it to stop doing that. So that will take care of that. And this is uh, this is a good one for today. C B Mo's question. Uh, what are the what are the toroidal transformers better at than regular ones? They are more efficient at converting uh, voltage to voltage. They're just more efficient. They're, they have a faster faster transition time from the primary to the secondary. Um, they just are more efficient. And that translates into a more articulate, snappier sound. Okay, that's, 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 that's what we all need to know. That's what I need to know. Hmm. I'm just a guitar playing dork. Yeah, I know. I don't know anything else. Uh, one of the things that I did when we when we introduced the single rack space, the the two rack space power amps, the two ninety two and the two fifty two. Mm -hmm. At that time, more people were saying, "Can we get a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more give, a little bit more forgiving power amp?" And uh, I don't want that. At at that time. Um, that was that was a bigger concern. People were less concerned about a transparent sound stage coming out of the power amp, uh, and more concerned about that it acts like the power section in a power amp, which generally has some give. And the problem with that is 
with a stereo power amp, you generally never use all the power that's available in it unless it's a very low power power amp. And then because of the, the fact that you're forced to make this kind of obscene jump from 20 watts aside to 50 watts aside because there are no real tubes that really get you the in between, you know, the 60, 70 yeah. kind of range. Yeah. It's it's like with a, an attenuator with the switch. It's either yeah. too much or not enough. Right. And that's the same thing with that. So um, uh, the, the deal is, is in a 50 watt amp, you have a single power transformer, a single power supply, and a single output stage driving a cabinet. With a stereo power amp, you have to have a big enough power supply to power both channels of that amp. Mm -hmm. So say, for example, a stereo 50 watt power amp. Mm -hmm. The power amp supply and its, and its associated power transformer have to have enough energy reserve to deliver full output from both channels to like two fifty watt amps, yeah. basically. So you think of it as this is just a fifty watt amp. Yeah. But really, like right. I, this is my ignorance of showing, but your what it actually has to have the guts like double that, like in stupid layman's terms. Like it's, right. Yeah. If you make it so that it's really spongy, when you're running it with both channels, it'll sound really spongy, and you're gonna go. Ah, oh, why is it so spongy? You know, uh, if you try, if you make the power supply robust enough so that both channels will, it'll do both channels justice. Mm -hmm. If you only use one channel, that channel becomes too stiff. Sure, that makes right? total sense. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and that is even exacerbated by a more efficient transformer like a toroid. So. Uh. Uh, for the 252 and the 292, we went to a standard rectangular style transformer to take advantage of that efficiency loss uh -huh. to give it a little bit more give, but not so much that it would just sound spongy and flubby under your fingers. Yeah. Um, well, that's never been a signature move. No, but the, it did the it did work out well, and it, and it worked out really well for players. Um, in the case of the LX2, it's got a toroid power transformer because you can't get, uh, well, actually you can get a transformer to lay down flat, use a flat format called a flat pack uh, to fit in a single space housing like that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that the, that flat pack format is inherently noisy. Hmm. It, 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 radiates a, a big magnetic field all around the inside of the chassis and makes and makes it really hard to keep the hum out of the audio signal so they would be noisy they would be they would bleed noise in the audio signal and they would make mechanical buzzing noise like is a there, razor the like an electric razor is, is there any way to design around that or are you just making the decision this is going to be a noisier piece of gear use a toroid power transformer that's which is what the lx2 has but that's going to be more expensive and drive the yeah but the it's a pressure. smaller the, the the 252 for example is actually 70 65 70 watts a channel mm -hmm. uh, it's about 60 to 65 running both channels simultaneously at full output mm -hmm. and just one channel alone will do 70 watts if you have the other channel on standby mm. so um that's got a lot of extra headroom mm. the lx2 is it's capped right at 50. That's it, that's all you get. But mm. people aren't playing as loud these days, so that actually works better. And the uh, the toroid design in there is designed to just start producing 50 watts maximum out of each channel and the, no extra headroom. So you can actually push the LX2 to, to a little bit of forgiveness because it was designed to not what what we call in engineering technology regulation in the transformer how well the transformer will stay within its voltage tolerances at maximum output mm. the the higher uh the 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 better the ability of the transformer to maintain its original voltage is called its regulation per, uh, ratio and percentage uh how much the the voltage is coming out of the transformer will change under maximum uh maximum output as opposed to 
you know, running it sort of at idle. Mm -hmm. it, the, so the regulation and the power transformer, the LX2 is like 5%, mm -hmm. which is tight. Yes. Um, so if you go over that, you'll start to get a, a little bit of a squishy sound out of it, which is cool. So because it's a people are playing quieter, they if they turn use a higher powered amp and turn it down, it'll tend to be a little stiffish. With the LX2, you can play it at lower volumes and it'll sound rich and natural. And the point there is that it would sound really good with preamps and modelers and stuff in lower volume environments, not to mention the fact that it's lighter and um, you know less expensive because it's so overall a smaller chassis I, and all that. I, I want to piggyback on uh, Lucas's question a while back about signature tones uh, coming from the 2150. Uh, and I guess my question is, what do you attribute the success of that power amp to? Why did it wind up being in so many different rigs? Why, like, what was magical about it? And I'm saying that as somebody who, uh, I've never played through one. Hey, you know what? That was just pure luck. That was being in the right place at the right time. And even Randall Smith will tell you that. I love this kind of answer. Well, I mean, it's just being real. I come to the NAM show. You could, you could. I just started blow smoke right now. I just started shipping power amps the way I thought they would sh should be made. Uh huh. And I had listened to everything that was out there at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm a gay guitar player at the time, and I'm listening to him going, "It's not quite what I'm wanting to hear." That's uh -huh. really all it was. And so, having built. Um, you know, we could actually bring one in because I have one here. Having having built a uh, a kit hi-fi tube power amp yeah. in my in my youth youth, yeah, yeah. Um, I understood how power amps work, and I th I think about this every once in a while. Where I think I was just destined to play with power amps because I got introduced to the power amp through the Dynaco Dynakit. That was one of the first, uh, like, electronics, like, real projects you kind of sunk your teeth into. Yeah, like, yeah. Power amps. Yeah, boy, that was intimidating, too. It was just like, whoa. But the instructions were, cut a piece of black 18-gauge wire three inches long and strip one quarter uh, inch of insulation off of each end. Now set that aside <laughs> and cut a white piece of 18-gauge wire four inches long. And, you know, you did a step-by-step. Step. I didn't know what I was doing. I was following the instructions step-by-step. Step. And my dad, who would come in and look in on me once in a while, like, are you being patient? Be patient. Don't try to rush because you're really impatient and you always try to rush. And mm. it's, it's the same when you build models. You're trying to paint it too oh soon. Oh, my God. I would rush with models. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I want to see it done. And there was this model of a of that rotary, the, the airplane engine with yeah. the eight cylinders yeah. on it. Yeah. It was actually a clear plastic functioning airplane engine. Uh-huh. It had a battery-powered motor, and the whole thing would turn, and mm -hmm. the pistons and all the gears and everything was an authentic scale reproduction, reproduction of this airplane engine. That's incredible. And I wanted that in the worst possible way for Christmas, and I got it for Christmas, oh. and I ruined it. I couldn't Being wait impatient. for the... the in the, on the cylinder heads, yeah. I couldn't wait for the glue to dry to put the pistons in it. I oh, just yeah. like yeah. couldn't wait. Yeah. So I put the pistons in before the glue was completely dry, and they stuck in there, and I ruined the whole thing. But you know what? Like you learned a lot about how cylinder heads and pistons work, <laughs> and how like precision that needs to be. So anytime you hear about you know head gaskets and and you know just the inner workings of an engine, you probably go <laughs> right back to that. Ah, yes. Yeah. You know, so not all is lost. You do learn things from that. Well, I it was, hurts, but it's and then and then I got really sick with the I think I had the measles or the flu or something. I was really sick and I was home for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. in bed. And I was starting to get sort of into electronics. You're the rock and pneumonia, man. Okay, would you like to do any more of that before I continue? Uh, I dole it out as we go. <laughs> I never know what it's going to happen. So, no um, I'm, uh, I'm reading uh, 
you know, a popular electronics magazine, popular mm -hmm. mechanics magazine. Yeah. And um, we got a copy of High Fidelity magazine mm -hmm. accidentally mailed to us. And I looked at that and I went, wow, this is great. It's got turntables and speakers and power amps and preamps and, and receivers and all the coolest stuff and all these huh. product reviews. And I would read the product reviews because they were really technical. And that's where I started learning terms like total harmonic distortion, intermodulation distortion, crosstalk, and RMS power. And Your blah, inner blah, blah. nerd was dancing. Oh, it was just like, and I had nothing but time to get lost in this thing. I've, I'm thinking of killing that, that maker's bottle. There's just a little bit left in there. Well, I think you should just... I'm just going to think of pounding that. Well, you have to... Do you want some? Let's see if we have permission to do that. But I'm sure we need we, we need Nico Chan's uh, do guidance. We have, do we have permission to cash that bottle of forty six? Oh, see, that's what you I really know what that want. Means. Yeah, that's actually yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing that the thing that was really intriguing about High Fidelity magazine mm -hmm. was in the back there was this little three by five card tucked into the binding. Okay. Called a reader service card. And the reader service card uh, referenced all the advertisements in the magazine. And if you wanted information about that manufacturer's product, you would just check the box. So it's opting into mailing lists. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Huh. So I checked off every box on the reader service card. There was like 20 of them to Harman Kardon, acoustic research, uh, Gerard turntables, all, you know, like all the best gear, Altec Lansing, JBL. I checked every single box on that reader service card and send it in. And all of a sudden within, I did that like over three months period. And pretty soon we were getting enough not only magazines that we didn't have subscriptions for, but we were getting anyway other magazines besides High Fidelity, but enough product catalog stuff in the mail to, to keep the house warm in the fireplace for like the next six months. And, and my parents just, were starting to like, what are, you, what are you doing? I'm reading it all. I yeah. just inhaled all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, Cheers. You know, the, the, the things that I was interested in like that, I would just cram them in would my... Would you sip that pitch and then continue? Wait, what am I doing? You're what did I do? You're taking a sip. Because we just... Oh, we just did... You... Jesus. Gee. Sometimes I have to really lead you around by the nose. And sometimes you have to lead me around by the nose. Okay. I remember, like, everything that you're saying reminds me of <laughs> how... You know, and my versions of things that I would get super interested in were slightly different, but I would cram all of this material into my folders in school. And that's really what I would be studying during class. So, like, those yeah. time periods yeah. of your life, yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm not really learning what they're teaching, but I am learning a ton yeah. about what I'm really fascinated yeah. by. It's part of that ADHD kind of thing. Like, you can't really get on anyone else's program, yeah. but you're obsessed with your own. And there was this, there was this, all the, the High Fidelity magazine did a product review on, on the latest thing that got sent to them, just like a Guitar Player and all, sure. all yeah. the other magazines. But yeah. they had this laboratory that did the testing okay called hirsch hook laboratories h-i-r-s-c-h-h-o-u-c-k so the minute they said laboratory i just thought guys in lab coats with scopes and test equipment up to the ceiling and they're wearing glasses and Spectacles. have clipboards and, yeah. and pocket protectors you know and i'm just thinking these guys are measuring and the stuff that was really intriguing when a new product would come out and the the uh, silent to noise ratio, uh, when they would test it and they would go, the silent to noise ratio was below the threshold of our test equipment to test. That was like, oh yeah, oh, my God. that's a whole mystery land. Of, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. I just it's thought, lost information. Like, that's like yeah, wow. Somebody really went. 
all the way on yeah, that. Yeah. And um, um, that just that kind of stuff stuck with me. One of the reader service card entries was Dynaco and Dyna Kits. And I knew, you know, there was Heath Kit and there was uh, there was Lafayette Radio and there was Allied Electronics and there were these different kinds of electronic companies that would sell little kits that you could build and i did all of that stuff but man when i built that dyna kit uh preamp and power amp that was a whole other level of when you turned it on and the tube started glowing and sound came out and it was stereo and the treble and bass controls so i mean it was just like i have really crossed the rubicon dude <laughs> you know? and i'm 11 you know i'm 10 11 years old and i'm just that. like going i can't believe i did this i love that so um the the whole power amp that that was a formative thing for me it was and just happened to be a power amp so everything associated with turning on a power amp after you build a brand new one mm -hmm. is just all geared towards that there's no smoke coming out of it <laughs> all right i'm halfway there there's sound coming out of it i'm 90 percent of the way there the sound is great i succeeded it's just yeah. like for a little kid like that that I didn't make it in sports, you know. I didn't, sure. This I, was I, your thing. This no, was your I, area. I just like th yeah. I could own this, and I I just like my whole my whole self esteem thing changed once I had done that, and I had other kids going, you know, coming over to my house and like that. I turned them on to High Fidelity magazine, and they would like come. Oh, come on over! I just built a, a pair of Dynakit power amps. And just check it out. I got. I got some EV three-way speakers, and I made a speaker cabinet and a wood shop, and 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 then I had kids coming over and like, can you build me one of those Dynakit power? So they bought the kits and brought them to me, and I charged them. You could buy the kit, or you could buy it assembled, and I charged the halfway between the kit price and the assembled price. So they're getting a deal. They're getting a deal. You're getting to build another one, which I, is like, oh yes. I don't yeah. have to buy one. I get to build another one. Yeah. Well, what I did was when I finished that one, I would give them mine because I had built a couple now and the wiring technique oh, you get was getting better. <laughs> so I'd, I'd give them mine as the finished one and keep the one that I just built that was finer inside because <laughs> yeah, now I've yeah. started to get some technique. Yeah, I was a little, I was a little squirrel, you know, but hey, the, the, he got... Well, he he look inside. And he goes, "That's amazing." And I didn't show him the one that I just finished. It yeah, was even more amazing. Yeah. But oh, that's funny. I wound up being kind of the clearinghouse for certain things uh, growing up too. The things that I would get obsessed with, and you know, when I was ten, eleven, I wound up like trafficking with, you know, sixteen-year-old kids. Like one of the things for me was like just having a, like procuring rare music for people, mm. and uh, I would have. I remember I would have 16 year olds like coming over and paying me to make recordings of all of this stuff that I'd collected. Like, you know, at the high school, obviously these kids are like, D dude, there's like this 11 year old who will make like, he <laughs> has all this music that you've been looking for. Like, here's where he is, go find him and pay him and he'll make you all these mixtapes. <laughs> You know, I just realized I really wanted to bring my, one of my Dynakit power amps in and show it to you guys. But the problem is it's, it's, it's in this whole shelf of records. Oh, and stuff we can't like pull that. it out. Well, well maybe we I can will. pull it out, but the problem is the speaker connectors are on those little screw tabs and stuff. So you have sure. to use the screwdriver to disconnect them and it's tight yeah. like this. So I'm not going to do that. Just I'll pull, okay. I'll pull it out on another time, but just holding them in my hand is just this, these little 60 watt mono blocks that are really awesome. I, okay. Anyway, that really drove the whole thing, and that's how I understood um, power amps. That's I, that was the I used one of those power amps and, and paired it with a homemade twin preamp stage to make a guitar amp out of it. And l shortly after, discovered that that's what Sun was doing. Mm. And when I opened the first time, a friend of mine, a bass player who brought me a Sun, he says, "Make it a noise. Can you check it out?" And I opened it up and I went, "Holy shit! This is a Dynaco Mark III with a Fender preamp in front of it on a chassis, just like I did, only." This looks professional. Did you ever have this kind of feeling? Because when I was younger, when I would get really interested in things, like I would put, like we all do, put things on a pedestal. Oh, yeah. And when you get close to understanding them, like the first time you open that up, you wait, I understand this. 
do you almost, I remember getting this sort of feeling of like, how do I explain it? Almost like I'm not supposed to be here. Like this is the realm of like the gods of this, but somehow I understand. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, this is, this is going to sound really sexist. This, this is going to sound. Information? Is Amanda here? Because this is going to be really sexist sounding. She's not here yet. But uh, it was like you spot this girl and she's really hot, and then when you actually start getting to date her and finding out that she's 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 got little quirks like everybody does, you just kind of go, oh, I, I, had, I had a lot different vision about how this was going to go and that I, was, that I was kind of trying to bark outside of my pay grade, you know, but it turns out, no, actually this is right where I belong. And, and when I opened up that sun... I don't sun, think that's sexist because you can feel that way if you're anybody. When I opened up the sun amp and I expected to be... Um, you know, this was like, I'd already looked into Fenders and Marshalls, but the sun was new. Yeah. And it was the new thing. And it had impressive sounding names like the 200S and the 2000S and the Scepter. And uh, they looked different, you know. And they had more, uh, the, the cabinets w weren't as sexy looking as a 412 cabinet maybe, but... They were, Somebody made it and they put it on the market and they're a real entity. And it was like the, the, the baffle was angled and it was ported. And I was like, oh, some engineer like in a white coat, you know, with uh, that with who's had agreed with a, with not a calculator, but with a slide rule and graph paper designed this cab. And I was like, I was impressed by that. Probably more than the guts of the end. But when I opened that sun for the first time and expected to be intimidated and went, wait a minute, this I is like my this. turf right here. Yeah, what the I hell? Yeah, 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 I yeah, kind of yeah. like went, but that's the I, thing I that I'm talking that's about. that's something that I could maybe do someday. With new skill acquisition, eventually you kind of, you get to the top of some mountains and you're like, wait a minute. And you're looking around and you're like standing shoulder to shoulder with yeah, and in a way, in a way, be... you you sort of feel like, you know, somebody somebody held the ladder out to you a little bit, you know. That I always sort of yeah. got that feeling that somebody was just like the 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 angels were kind of booting me along a little bit, and and the 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 ladder would come down, and I would grab on that, and like I'd pull myself up a rung, and I felt like some something is driving me towards this. And that was the thing I was talking about. I always sort of thought that because I was more interested in playing music, but the the music thing that was always a hot field battle but every time i turned to electronic pursuit it seemed like somebody was handing me a, a road map you know and it was just like yeah but i want to do that yeah but you really want you should be doing this yeah but i want to do that yeah it was really it's it, to this day it's still a struggle sure but sure. um i think that that's what really drove me towards Focusing more on the power amps and the behavior of power amps and the function and the importance of power amps to the overall thing of how it works. And as far as the signature of it, well, I mean, okay, all coming all around to the the us coming out in the face of well, Mesa Boogie made power amps. They didn't make any of the two space ones yet. They were still making the big ones with way more tubes. The Gigantor than, Stadium yeah, 8 I mean, million what, or whatever they, they, they were called. They, they didn't need... No, the Coliseum. They didn't need the 16 Coliseum. effing tubes to do like, that. Oh my God. You know, and I thought eight. I thought when I first actually, when I first started thinking about the design of the 2150, it was originally going to have eight EO34s and I just thought, that's just too many. And at that time, the tubes weren't that expensive, but they were relatively expensive. And I thought, and actually the difference in price between 6550s and EL34s was not that great. Mm. And I thought, hey, you know what? If there was only four power tubes to replace in a stereo 100 watt power amp, as opposed to eight, that would be... Um, that would be, you know, more cost effective maintenance wise. Sure. That's why I picked 6550. Is then I went, okay, so now the challenge is going to be to make the 6550 power amp sound like an EL34 power amp. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did for the most part, but uh, I learned very early on by building the first 2150 um, that 
that I used a Marshall phase inverter to drive the power tubes because mm -hmm. that was the original drawing that I made to drive four EL34s per channel. Ow! Oh, this, oh, it's almost a remnant of just the original idea. Yeah. And you didn't update your, well, maybe we should look at the phase inverter. Yeah, I didn't really think about That's all so that interesting. Yet. I had to learn that skill yeah. about how to make a phase inverter do this particular job better. Mm -hmm. I didn't need it when you had four EL34s sure. because the four EL34s, first of all, they had more transconductance than 6550s, so they would do more of the work mm -hmm. of the final amplification stage, where 6550s, yeah. at a higher play voltage, um, you needed, you couldn't just keep driving the phase inverter because the phase inverter would max out before the power tubes were at their clipping point. Yes. And that made it sound compressed from the standpoint of phase inverter compression. Right. And... Um, so uh, that that is what informed that decision, and I and I went um, going back to the 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 little badminton game that we've been going back and forth with Dave about why didn't they just make a a, a two Marshall hundred watt power stage in the box? That's what everybody wanted, and I went. Yeah, you know, in reality, that isn't what everybody's going to want because there's going to be this built-in limitation in there that, and if you just basically clone all that twice and put it in a box, it's going to be too much weight. It's going to be too expensive. It's going to be, uh, it's still going to be a stereo power amp and it's not going to behave like one 100 watt head. It's going to behave well, like a 200 watt head. Yeah, and, and really you know, that's the thing about the, the, the 252 uh, as opposed to a 50 watt amp, why doesn't my 252 sound like a 50 watt head? Because it's a 100 watt head yeah. split into two channels, right. 50 watts right. aside, right? Right. In effect, the power supply is a 100 watt power supply. So then, in a in the classic power amp, that was the the expression and the demonstration of that. With eight EO34 power tubes, you have to have this big, giant toroid transformer that can supply all of those tubes and then it has to have its built-in design uh extra safety um you know measure of of uh safety factor performance safety factor so that it will do what it's claimed to do but it is in effect now a 200 watt amp it's not a 100 watt amp i wish twice. i wish we would have brought that up with dave when he was here well, because yeah. my thinking was that if, you know, uh, in those rack systems, you had access. I mean, you know, we, we didn't have uh, the attenuation products that we have today. Right. We right. did have load boxes and people were running heads using Marshall heads. The entire head is essentially a preamp, right? Mm -hmm. So in within the, the the Marshall head that you had, you could run it the full right hand sweep and right. have it be a gain machine. Right. You're engaging the power section right. for all of that stuff and it's awesome. And then you take that out at a line level and you mm -hmm. run that through the rest mm -hmm. of your rack. Why would you want the power section that is not only handling that amplifier, but all of your effects and all of that stuff, why would you want that power amp to behave like the Marshall? Because I, I get why you want the Marshall power section to behave like the Marshall power section within the head ecosystem. Right, exactly. Duh. exactly. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Exactly, yeah, yeah. But that's not what a rack And that's what I ran into for. pretty early on. Once I put it all together for myself, I went, yeah, but I got this, but I'm missing all of this. Yeah. And, and, um, and then when I ran up against, I'm trying to make this a more efficient, cost-effective design... For a, from the reliability and serviceability standpoint, then I ran up against, oh, I gotta do something about that phase inverter. So that's when the original design morphed into the next level of the design and, and tackled all that. And once I did that, then that power amp worked great with well, everything. What was the impetus to look at the phase inverter? Was it uh, customer feedback or just you continuing to listen to it? Do you remember? Oh, it was definitely me continuing to listen to it and uh, going, uh, yeah, 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 but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. There was all, because I was still playing mm -hmm. and I'm going. So you were hauling this thing out. Yeah, and, you were using and I'm, I'm just thinking, yeah, it's doing this part cool, but it doesn't do that part cool. 
And then when I started really, when I first started producing them, I had very sort of rudimentary test equipment. Okay. I didn't have a big lab. Sure. I was building them in my apartment. Hey, um, I'm going to throw up a, uh, a picture that you sent. All right. Well, let me, let me get Scott's question real quick because that, that's, that's, there's sort of a relevance there. I don't want to address that. Um, but right. hold on, just tell me All right. this. All right. Is this? Yeah, is that is this? actually, no, that's actually my, after I built this prototype originally. Yeah. Um, I had a roommate and I was trashing the apartment. There was parts and electronic stuff and it was <laughs> unsafe. And, and. Poor roommate. And my, my roommate and I were both like party animals, you know. So it was dangerous <laughs> to walk in the front door in, into kitchen. our living room because on any given day, there would be like 200 capacitors all strung together with wires <laughs> uh, being reformed. And we'll get into that later. Dude, but, that is awesome. But I had to move out of that apartment so that I could uh, start building something. And I wasn't really ready to make the commitment to go rent a commercial space yet. So... I got another apartment, a two bedroom apartment, and I made one bedroom the uh, the, the shop. Now turn off uh, Scott's question for a second. I want you to see the rest of this picture. Um, Let me find it. Sorry, Scott, we're getting well, there, we'll, man. We'll, we'll get to your question in just a sec. Kind of blowing this here. Because uh, it, it actually is a good question. Now you see below the red there? Yep. There's a, there's a, there's, the red is covering a piece of two by four that's sitting on two four twelve uh, road cases. Hell yeah! And then the back. Oh yeah, you can the see the back that. riser of the bench is a head road case. So I built this whole workbench out of the road cases for the shit that I was touring with. <laughs> and uh, and so that's in my spare bedroom, and that's when we first started making the first hundred. 2150 power amps okay. in that bedroom. All right, all right. Well, maybe we'll come back to that, hmm. but for now, let's definitely. So, Scott, any chance for a custom place for power amps? The blue, purple are awesome. Here's the thing about the colors, though. It's as as we discussed earlier about, like with the Kasha thing. It's not just about the color; it's the whole execution of the cosmetic, right? Okay. So. Um, at, at that period of time, the color thing didn't come about as a result of, hey, let's just do colors. That would be bitching. Uh, you know, Mesa was doing colored vinyls and hardwoods and things like that. So this sort of custom thing, you know, uh, Soldano was making purple heads That's and right. purple preamps and the, and the alligator thing, which I think looked horrible. We actually made a pit bull half stack in alligator. Did you? One half stack, wow. a head and a cabinet. One. That was we did enough. it one time for a customer in Finland who just flat out insisted on it. So we did it. I think it looked horrible, horrendous. It looked it looks fine on Soldano's, but I just thought it looked horrendous on our amps. So yeah. we did it one time. But the whole impetus of doing custom y colory blah 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 it, it, <laughs> it started to feel sort of really artificial. Okay. But the reason that we did a color in the very first place is because they started out being black. Yeah. We did the purple so that it would match with the X88 preamp. Oh, serious? Because everybody was buying the Soldano preamp. I was like, so did you, you know what would be really oh, bitching is if my power amp matched my preamp. Did you actually call Mike and get the exact like number No, of I color? didn't need to do it. I, I had one. Uh -huh. We actually traded a power amp for a preamp. He oh. wanted a power amp for his shop to demonstrate his preamp. Did you trade him a black one for the? No, one? I traded him a purple one. But so then you already had the purple one. How did you get the exact shade, or are they the exact shade? I had a preamp that I borrowed from Making Music. And were you able to take it to the I just, guy yeah. and go, "What is this?" They color? know which one it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They know that. Okay, with this alloy of alloy of aluminum, the purple is going to come out this shade. So if you wanted exactly this shade, it's not so much the shade of the anodized dye, although that is controllable under certain circumstances. And there's different manufacturers that make different colors of that same similar dye. Yeah. So if you buy purple dye from one manufacturer, it'll be one kind of a purple. And from another manufacturer, it'll be a darker or lighter, almost pink kind of a look. 
So not only do you have to know what the what is available out there from the anodized dye suppliers, you have to know how it's going to behave on 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 which alloy of aluminum. Oh, and great story mm -hmm. about al aluminum anodized dye. The dye on all of the colors that we used on our power amps is made by a company called Sandoz. Sandoz is the big industrial chemical company in Switzerland that invented LSD. <laughs> Remember the Sandoz LSD? No. The Sandoz... I don't. The Sandoz... Uh, Research laboratory was the laboratory that invented LSD. And the researcher at Sandoz test tested this, uh, this chemical compound that he created from this, uh, this mold. And he rode a bike to work and he rode his bike home and he got halfway home and he just had to set the bike down and sit on a bus bench for a while because he was raging high on this new hallucin hallucinogen that he had just accidentally invented. Okay, fast forward 20 years Sandals. or so, I'm gonna, we have, I have a friend who lives in Switzerland. We go, uh, I, I happen to be in Basel. I was in, I was in Frankfurt and I went to visit some, a, a deal, some dealers of ours in Milan between Milan and Frankfurt, had to cross the the uh, the Alps, so it had to cross through Switzerland to get there. So I stopped for a night or two in Basel, Switzerland, where my friend lived. His wife founded in 1886. Yeah, yeah. his wife, his father, was a managing director at Sandoz. So. His wife's parents came over for dinner, and I told I told him. He says, "Oh yeah, so and so, my 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 wife's parents are uh, you know my in laws are coming for dinner with us." And he says, "Whatever you do, don't say anything about LSD. The guy is really a uh, stuffed shirt. He's just like does not want to hear anything about that." Yeah. And he's looking at me. I'm you know, okay. Are we all on the same page here? Yeah. And um, I went okay, and so we're we're um, uh, we're at dinner. We're at, at his house, and I'm, we're talking. And I said, "It's uh, you know, it's really interesting that, that that you are involved with the Sandoz company. You know, Sandoz is the manufacturer of the." And I stop, and I just pause for a second, and. <laughs> My friend and his wife are leaning it toward into the table, looking at me do like, "Don't not do it! Do not do it!" And the I went, "Words, your company makes the dye that we use on the power amps," and and the guy was, "Oh, that's very nice to hear." And and my buddy and his wife were just like, "You did that on purpose, uh -huh. you bastard!" And it was really great, but. Um, Nice move, man. Yeah, I, I had to go there. Respect. I had to. It was like, that's dude, a good one. It was. And that's when you like, you do it, and then you just look at him and you're like. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, Sandoz makes the best anodized dyes. S A N D O Z. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really interesting meeting this really super square, straight exec at, at Sandoz Corporation. And I was like, you know, when I was in junior high school. <laughs> but can you bring them back? Will they be brought back? Is that okay, well, he, 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 long story. It, it wasn't just. Long story a, longer? It wasn't just about the color. It was that there was an application for the color. And then on top of that, if we're going to go to the effort of making this color, then we have to go to the effort of making the, the handles sort of commensurate with the design. And sure. we made these. Uh, sort of unusual single block rather than this, the stupid typical, you know, chrome rack handles that are too thin and hurt your hands yeah. and all that. We made a, we designed a robust handle that would sort of look congruent with the rest of the design. I, just, of the I used panel. them today when I hauled that damn thing in. They yeah. worked great. Yeah. 
So there, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of that goes into the. So it really wasn't about color. Now, okay, I say all that. See, I what, think you're bullshitting actually. Okay, it kind of is about color. Okay, so partially, you know. So here's where I'm going to concede your point. When we came out with the GPDI. Oh, dude! Did, I still want a purple one. That we did. Is we so did that. Cool. We did that. Um, that Kickstarter thing, and then, as we were going along, uh, somebody mentioned, "You know, are you going to do any colors?" And I went, "No." And Paul, uh, he was like, "You know, maybe we should consider doing colors." And I said, "You know, it's just a can of worms. Unless you're going to, if you're going to do the color, then the artwork has to be right. You know, it's not just." making an anodized color you got to make everything because uh, all of the piece it has because to be. the purple ones are, it's it's all white silk screening right versus the black right yes yeah, so the, that's the black different. is a white silk screen and the purple one was white and then we did another couple of colors where the silk screen reversed in color and then uh, the, so you cool. know i mean it's just like and you're not but doing I was, that for the for the the next generation GP. But I was saying, I was telling the guys, it's not just about a color. The whole artwork thing, the whole look of it, has to be commensurate with the color change. It's yeah. not just a different color. It's yeah. a different whole attitude. And and uh, I, he says, well, maybe we should do a poll <laughs> to see what colors people would like. And oh so, well, that's not even fair. So we did we did a, a range, and. And the other compli the other complication is on the GPDI, the aluminum alloy is different than that alloy. Okay. So all of those colors will come out. They're gonna look different. They're gonna look slightly different. Yeah. Because they're the gonna GPDI, look good. The GPDI purple is darker than this. It's different than that, yes. and that's because the, it's the same dye, but the alloy is different. Right. And the alloy is different. Why don't you just change the alloy? Because that's an extruded front panel. Mm. So it's a softer aluminum. You can't do that with aircraft. Uh, 60, 60, 61 T6. Right. It's and you're never going to make a GPDI with that thickness. Like, it has to be different. Like, yeah. you can't. Yeah. It just. Yeah. It would I mean, be that's. ridiculous to that, make the, the, a product like know, that the, with the same. In, in, uh, in, 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 um, in an extrusion, you're squeezing aluminum through basically like a cookie cutter form, yeah. right? Yeah. You're squeezing aluminum through this slot. Yeah. To make it the shape. And uh, so that's a softer alloy, and it's going to look different. So anyway, we came up with colors. We basically took six. We took the panels to an anodized shop and had them do in six different colors. Out of those six, we picked three or four that we thought looked good. And then we said, what colors would you guys like to see off of these? And everybody picked black, purple, and silver. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And man, the 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 response we got to that was overwhelming so then we created up the artwork to go with it so that it would look good and then we did those colors uh but i, I should have got a purple i, I was really purple. like this at first because i just knew what a can of worms it would be it was a can of worms we pulled it off but people just don't understand how you know that that there's there's going halfway and there's going all the way you know and one of my best the favorite comments my favorite compliments i got was was from uh, Thomas Blue of Blue Guitar. Okay. He says, you know, in his inimitable German accent, you know, Stevie, the the thing that I like about you, man, is you go all the way. And and I just felt like uh, somebody understands that. Well, Steve, I have... I that, have... You, that there's a... You get, you got to cross the line. You had to cross the line on the color thing. You had I had to cross the line to get a, a pair of 6550s uh, per channel on a stereo power amp to sound good. And once I did that, a bunch of other companies naturally copied it because they had somebody show them how to do it. And I don't like tooting my own horn, but I mean, it was just like, somebody has to take the risk well, and, and hope that, Steve, and like expect sparks and flames to come out at first and figure out, oh, okay, I know what I did wrong. And, but and I then think fix you're, that. Just, you're just being, the, you're just being you. Fire. I just like, fire, fire, fire. fire. Yeah, no, you are, uh, <laughs> in, 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 uh, in, in the time that I've known you, I've definitely seen that. Like, even, even, even doing this show, like some of the ridiculous things that we get up to in here, in terms of the rigs and stuff, mm. I would never bother. Like, I just, it's just not worth it. 
And you'll spend days on some of this stuff because yeah, you can't leave it alone. No, it won't leave me alone. That's the problem. That makes sense. Now, there are other things in my life that I'm like that with. Stephen King described this. Oh, man. His I muse. love him talking about He his describes craft. his muse. Was it Stephen King or was it... Was it uh, Stephen I think it was, King's amazing when he's I talking about the I think it was him or it might have been... Um, 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 uh, cat squirrel, uh, 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 cat cat's cradle. Uh, 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 songwriter. Slaughterhouse Five, the book, the writer. Oh, Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut might have been him. One of those two guys described their muse as no, it wasn't either one of them. It was uh, it was uh, Hunter S. Thompson. His muse was this animal that rode around on his back and pulled his hair and screamed in his ear. Mm what he was going to write and about and how he was going to write it. And he couldn't, he had to write this thing a certain way to get this creature, this screaming, angry creature off, of his, off his shoulders. Off yeah. of his shoulders. Yeah, yeah I, that's cool. I mean, that's kind of how I feel about some of this stuff. It's just like, it won't leave me alone. I mean, sometimes what I do when I go to sleep is I put earphones on and I, yeah. and I find a, I find a, 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 a blog. Yeah. Like, talk loud enough to where I can't think anymore. That's so... You need to obliterate so my own thoughts. Really arcane stuff that I can sort of get into if I can't sleep and want to listen to it. Yeah. But hopefully it's, it's arcane enough that it's just like, it's put like insider politics kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm. just like going through the motions of, you know, how the Supreme Court works and like, I'm out, you know. And I wake up three or four hours later with... I put on These history headphones stuff. stuck in my ears, and I got a headache because I've been laying on them. Right, and, totally. And and, totally. and three blogs have gone past since then, but I, I use that. That's always to, kind of fun when you just like, to turn my brain off. When you look at your phone, you're like, how many hours did this? Yeah. Take? Oh. <laughs> Before I woke up at like four forty-five in the morning and finally turned the shit off and took my yeah, or else it finally switches to something else and it goes to YouTube and it's like the Archies and all of a sudden it's playing <laughs> Sugar Sugar and like. Wow. Or, or, or here's the worst. The advertisement comes yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. At twice for, the volume. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. We never answered Scott's question. Okay. We talked all around. All right. Custom plates for current power amps. I don't know. The way I would approach it is if we come up with a different design of power amp and then maybe do that. Now... We have had, since we released the Classic, uh, there is a reason that we did the Classic in black, purple, and chrome. And the reason we did it in purple is because that amp had to be polished to a mirror finish. And with the quality of chrome plating, the difficulty in getting it plated properly, mm -hmm. uh, it was just too difficult to do it in chrome. So we chose the purple color for that because we could get it f mere flat just like the original classic and the matching handles and all of that all anodized at the same time so that it would look bitchin'. Um, since we did that, we have had people con con us, contact us and say, are you going to do the 2150 again? And I'm like, well, you know, it's not that I don't want to. I would love to do it if, if there was going to be enough potential sales out there to justify the effort uh, but we'd have to run all the chassis again and run the front panels the nice thing about the 2150 is it's a grain panel rather than polished uh -huh. so it's easier to analyze it's easier to grave so it would be actually easier to do and do in a couple of different colors so if we were going to reissue the 2150 we might do that grab in, some extras while you're at in it in colors again uh, but what other product would we, would we do that would need a color and it, it there isn't anything so the custom power amp thing uh these days i think well why would we make a custom colored lx2 kind of like for what, now uh, yeah. that's about it probably but then that right? that panel is well that the aluminum that i don't know i th i think that would have to be for another reason just besides being a color and I think it would probably have to be something like now. Don't you guys all go out out in the in the the, the blah blah verse out there and say, "Hey, Fry is going to make twenty one fifties again?" Because I wouldn't, 
I don't, I'm not saying that we would, and I'm not saying that we wouldn't. I'm just saying that if we were going to do something colored, that would probably be part of a project like that, because then it, it, there's a logic. It makes sense to do that, right? Okay. It's just, just colors in and of themselves. They don't make that much of a statement, but if you bring back the 2150 in these colors, then it would be like, oh, yeah, I can get my hands on a new one again. Yeah, that would be cool. I could, yeah. I could get behind that, but yeah. it, it's gonna be. If I, even if I decided to do that today, it would be a year and a half before they actually came to fruition. So sure. who knows? Sure. Okay. Well, let's let let yeah right, Rob. What's Nam anymore? Yeah. Hey, uh, so let's move into talking about uh, the 2150 and the prototype that we have behind us and locating it in storage and the story behind its creation and evolution and all of that stuff. Well, actually, yeah, that came out of, that came out of the Pitbull head, okay. which was the original Pitbull design. That had four EL thirty fours in it. While you're doing that, I'm gonna make an interesting uh, mongrel drink. Uh, <laughs> um, where uh, one of the guys that worked at, at Brower Reynolds, which was one of the first adopters of our power amps, um, I had shown them the prototype of the pitbull head, and one of the guys that worked there said, "What well, you know." Why don't you make the power amp section of that in a stereo rack mount power amp? That would be awesome. And I went, yeah, no. that's kind of... Do you remember who asked you that? Yeah, his name is uh, Lon Cohen. He's got his own um, vintage gear rental company now uh, called Lon Cohen Rentals. And that was his question to me, would that be feasible to do? And so I took that thought and I went around to a couple of dealers I'd, I had just recently left Valley Arts and was working for another company, but I was still buddies with them. And I went in and talked to the head sales guy there, the sales manager, and sort of pitched him the idea. And he was just like, yeah, bring it. So I talked to two or three different people and they were all like, yeah, do it. You know, but people always do that. They, oh yeah, you got an idea, yeah, do it. That's absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And then it's all left up to you like, Okay, the financing, the execution, like, of course, everybody's like gung-ho on, sure, do something, do the thing. Yeah, yeah. It's like As Sam if, Kinison did a bit about, you know, partying for three days and and uh, uh, and uh, all of his, he's like thinking about cheating on his girlfriend with this other girl and all his messed up friends that don't have girlfriends are like all egging him on. Yeah, do it, man, do it. That'd be awesome. But do it. Yeah, do it. And he was like, "Yeah, okay. I totally ruined my whole, my whole life, and I'm I'm glad I was an entertainment center for all you exactly you, you clowns, because everybody will encourage you to do something if you got an idea. And the, oh yeah, and because the they want to be it. entertained. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be the guy who I point and laugh at. Go yeah, do it. Yeah, you might spend a whole bunch of money developing this product, and it and it'll and nobody will want it, but but you know they won't say." Well, they won't say that. They won't present it that way. They'll just say, yeah, do it. Do it, man. And then if it sucks, well, then we won't buy it, of course. You know, Or if right. we don't like the way you did it, we won't buy it. Or if we don't like the price, do we won't buy it. Do you want to invest? Well, no, but yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah do, do it. it. Yeah. But uh, I, I was more naive then, and I sort of took everybody at their word, and I went ahead and um, started mm -hmm. mapping it out. And then once I started getting into it, I thought, you know, this thing with eight EL 34s, it's crazy. It's nuts. Why do that? And I've worked on enough mesas with those millions of power tubes, and they're going, it's just like, you know what? You know what would be great? It's if it had the minimum, had the maximum performance that people expect and the minimum number of tubes in it to accomplish that. So um, that was kind of an early sort of a, a minimalist uh drive that that uh, I got that hooked me in doing some of these things uh, to get the most performance out of the least number so, of components. But so when, when you decided to build this, uh, did you uh, do it with no orders, with nothing other than I'm just... When gonna... I built this, no, I didn't have any orders, I didn't have anything. I so just you thought... just found the like got, pulled the parts together. Yeah. You had a concept, you drew it up. You executed... Well, I worked at this repair shop and we were we were building we were we were doing 
mostly repairs, but we were also converting voltages on digital keyboards, you know, electronic keyboards that were coming in from Japan. Okay. Because... Do you remember what they were, type they of were keyboards? DX7s and so on and so forth. Really? Because the M1? One, did you do the Korg M1? I don't know. We did them all. Wow. All the ones that, that were coming out in the late 70s and early 80s, when the 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 yen to the dollar ratio was really extreme so you could fly to Tokyo spend a weekend in a nice hotel eat great food go to all the great bars and buy a hundred DX7s and bring them back and make money all you had to do was convert them to domestic voltage whereas the US dealers guitar centers and Valley Arts and all the stores that sold electronic keyboards through the normal channels they had them, but they were like five, three, four, five hundred dollars more. Sure. Right. Yeah. So you could go gray market in these keyboards, and and we had a transformer supplier in the valley. We had them make a transformer that would convert them to 120 volts from 100 volts. Yeah. And uh, you couldn't buy them direct from Korg or, or or Yamaha or any of those companies like that. You had to be a certified dealer and you had to be a, a, a authorized distributor and do that so a couple of guys in la were making flights every that's so month. funny to me that you say that because one of the coolest things about moving to la was i was finally local to this whole sort of secondary industry of people who mod gear mm -hmm. and i'm like oh man when i used to live in colorado it'd be like i don't want to send my unit away for that okay i just won't do it yeah but here it's like you need all the people who do this stuff like, oh, I have this stereo ribbon mic, and you, oh, you put a different transformer in there. Oh, really? Yeah. Like, and I'm, it's and like, some people were good at it, and some people were lousy at yeah, it. Yeah, but you'd be like, ah, oh, man, you have to send away for it. Here, it's just like, no, no, no. It's, it's right there at Studio your City. Right, yeah. yeah it's, it's, I love that kind of thing. So, as a result of that, <clears throat> bye bye. I had just, um, I'm all good. I'm all good. I'm good too. As a result, you, as a result of that, um, I just went to the local um, uh, surplus electronics store, and I bought the chassis and some switches, and I had sockets from my repair hoarding uh, thing, and I bought some impede selector switches at the surplus place and some jacks I already had miscellaneous resistors and capacitors all i needed was transformers and i went to the transformer supplier that made our bootleg conversion transformers for the dx7s oh. and, and i said do you know anything about tube amps and the guys like just, the company was called jackson transformers and okay. they were a third a three generation company the grandfather started it and then the the his son turned it into a bigger business and then the grandson was actually the production manager and I got friendly with him his name is Brent Jackson so we got we got buddy buddy and I had him uh I told him what I wanted to do and he says oh yeah well my grandpa could could design that exactly what you want so I scratched it all on a piece of paper and handed like it to my him my grandpa yeah this is late 80s grandpa yeah yeah so he grandpa's was in, not around anymore yeah yeah oh this is cool so he was the last the his son and grandson weren't engineers they were like production people and yeah they're and, they're, they're and helping guys in business business, business the, the grandpa's the, the engineer the, the, the middle the middle guy did ran the business right the son ran the production and grandpa had the engineering chops and he was getting pretty close to retiring and they eventually shut down the company because they wanted out oh. uh, but there was this period so where... So these are Jacksons? Everything is Jackson. Oh, I love this. So uh, they made the tra the output transformers and the toroid. They made it all in-house. They made like made me one pair of output transformers and one power transformer. Do you remember what they charged you? Um, this is all custom spec. No, these were samples. They made them for me as samples. Whoa. Like, okay, we'll make these as samples, and are you? Well, I'm going to do a production of these. Okay, well, we'll make samples for you, and then you'll give us an order. Yes. So these are the samples. Right. So they made, they made me a, a sample set to, to try, and I built them, and the, 
output transformers weren't quite right. And I didn't know that, but I knew that they weren't working quite right. So I went to, I went to Gramps and I said, everything looks really nice, but these are the specs that I'm, these, these are the results that I'm getting with these output You're transformers. Testing them. And I'm, I'm getting kind of confusing results because they don't match up with the calculations that I think I understand. Yes. So two things are happening. Either I'm calculating it wrong or there's something wrong in the transformers. And we went back and forth and back and forth. And he's, and he's like going, well, why are you calculating like this? And I said, well, because that's the circuit. And he said, yeah, but you're only calculating for two power tubes. And you said this product has four power tubes in it. I said, yeah. But it's a stereo power amp. There's two ch tubes per channel. So each output transformer has two power tubes and a push-pull circuit. He's like, oh, oh, I thought you were using four per channel. So he right. was He's winding. seeing it as like one, yeah. like it's basically a 100 watt. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, he wound the output transformer to drive four power tubes. Sure, yeah. And he went, oh. And then he gave me the new numbers and I plugged, I plugged them into my calculation and, th and then all the numbers just lined right up and I went, okay, so I'm not a math idiot. I actually sort of am decent at math. I'm, not, like, a, hey, I'm not a whiz, but I'm decent at it. I'm not a moron. That's all. good I, news. I actually s spilled a drink with my special, special glass and I didn't break my special, special hey, glass. Hey, you know what? High five. I'm so thrilled that I didn't break that because... All hell would have broken loose. So by the way, um, while anyway, so he made another set and boom, all the numbers lined up and I went, okay, we're good to go. And I took that, I took that and around. that's what's in here. I took that around to bands. I took it around to stores and everybody went, okay, whenever you're ready to produce one store said, I'll take 10 of them. What store was that? That was making music. They said, we'll take, we'll take 10. So making music really got you started. In and the they paid business. in advance for them so that I could afford to go buy all the parts. So that's what Because the did. pit bulls weren't, weren't, weren't uh, giving you enough capital to start. I wasn't product. into the pit bulls yet. I was just starting what? to do that. And it turned out I had made the pit bull prototype, but it turned out that what people really wanted more then another head was this power amp for their rack systems. And I was at, sort of at the beginning of the whole rack craze when Bradshaw was starting to do it and I was working with Buzzy Feeton. And okay, wait still... wait a minute. Just to, to clarify this, sorry to interrupt you. But, That's all right. So obviously the pit bull came first. The pit bull came first the as far as the second, prototype. But it was actually the power amp the power that amp financially went went... lit you up as right, a company exactly. and allowed you to complete the pit bull mission. And then right. Interesting. Okay. Right. I wasn't clear on that. And then once the power amp came out and started getting this really wide acceptance, and then a couple of people came around and went, you know, we, can you make one with EL34s? I said, well, I can, but why would I do that? We got this really great, well, but I just want EL34s. And okay. So that's how the classic came about was it was originally make a power amp with EL34s. You know what? I got a better idea. I'll make it with half as many tubes and and it'll have all this dynamic range it'll sound Carlos great. good night man thanks for hanging Carlos absolutely um, see you next time and uh, so when the when the the clatter got loud enough to do the classic then I went it's gonna be a lot of work it's gonna be a lot of tubes and yeah I can do it um, it's going to be expensive, and is this when you? This, I just kind of went. One? Well, if it's going to be like this, then in order to make it worth my while to do it, now I know a little bit more about what I'm doing. I need to make sure that we make enough money doing it. But is this what? Uh, is this the motorcycle ride moment? No, the motorcycle ride moment was before. It's the two ninety two. Oh, it's before this. Yeah, the motorcycle ride moment was. Can you tell the story? Because this is awesome. Well, I love the story. After it's very after human. the prototype was made, and I took it around, and then and then making music said, "We'll buy as many as you can make, and we'll give you a bunch of money up front to make them." Then I had to go, because you are a working musician. You're mm -hmm. like, I came to L.A. to play right. guitar right. and to have a band and get signed and do the thing, and I've been repairing shit to earn a living. And then I started building things on my own because in my own tonal chasing, I got to a point where it's like, look, 
I think I reached the end of the road with what other people are building. I, I'm stuck. I got to build my own stuff. Yeah. And so you start coming up with your own designs and you're like, well, maybe other people would be interested in it. And that's the pit bull. Right. Hold that thought. What was that, 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 was it that drink that we were drinking, the first one? A something coffee that I remember. An Irish coffee. Well, she called it a Kentucky coffee. Kentucky coffee. Because we and she said she was going to make another Irish whiskey. A, a, deluxe, a Cadillac version of that? Because uh, I'm, I'm dying to check I, that I out. I can't have any more because I made my own um, uh, drink here with the Lafroy and the coffee liqueur. And I got the balance right. And yeah. I'm flying high right All right, now. fine. I'm going to um, need some food after this. Cause well, yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking if I do... If I do this, that's going to make me, that's going to take me on another path that I've been. That's uh, scary. I've been avoiding getting on that ride for a long time, and I fought it. And I had to think, can I get on that ride and still be on the other ride at the same time? Or if I can't be on both rides at the same time, how long will it take me to get to be on this ride before I can get back on that other ride or do I lose that other path? And I had to go really think about that. And the, the way I did that was I couldn't just lay around awake nights and have to go to work and have to do this and go to rehearsal and go play some gigs out of town and blah, blah, blah. I couldn't do all that simultaneously. And you think you can until you try and do it. You're yeah. like, all, damn all it, I, I can't all do I, it. All I did was toss and turn and get farther and farther in the I'm the, That's where I'm at in my life right now. So I got on I, I got on my motorcycle and I left town. I told maybe... You needed to go on a vision quest. I, I, told, my, <laughs> I told my boss at the repair shop that I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I'm going on the road. And he was just like, oh, okay, so you're going to go out and play with your band for a couple weeks. Yeah, no problem. I, I didn't say, no, you're wrong. I just let him believe what he believed. And I took off. I got on my bike, and I just headed east and kept driving. And I figured I'm just going to keep driving until I think I've gone far enough. And Where I, did you go? Where, how oh, far did I, you go? I, I went through uh, Yellowstone. I camped out in the hills by myself in oh my god i love this story there this is something that i would have done i would yeah. i would be laying there in my in my sleeping bag in my tent and bears and deer and cats and wildlife would walk by my tent at, late at night and sniff around or growl because and, you're semi running away you know you're going to return you're running away for a moment because you're like i need to get away from this shit. it's yeah. way too heavy i have to go figure it out I'm going to return. I just have to go clear my head. And I met cool people on the way. I met a family that was driving around the country that was from England. And they were in the United States touring the country in a Winnebago. And they had two little kids. And they were like, yeah, we want our kids to see the world and experience, you know, what outside of their... They, and, you know, you saw the picture of me. Yeah. And with the Harley sleeveless Harley shirt yeah, and all yeah. leather and on the Harley, and they were like, "Hey, they came into the campground. I was the only person in this little campsite, and they came in there late at night after I was already asleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I got out and, and the guy's sitting sitting outside his Winnebago with a cup of coffee, and he's like, "Good morning, how you doing? Would you like a cup of coffee?" And he invited me over, and we started chatting, and, and I asked me where I was from. I asked him where he's from. Man, he brought I his kids out and introduced me to his kids, and we played, and we, we had breakfast, and we chatted, and wished each other bon voyage after we left. And I, I met a bunch of people like that. So I just kind of got completely away from the whole L.A. thing and got completely out of my normal element, and it really freed my mind up, and I just went... Because this, what this moment is, is you're going, all right. If I say yes to this, it's not that I have to quit playing guitar and quit, but I really am like this is this is the fork. This yeah, is and the I think fork. I think what I arrived at was what's the worst that could happen if I take advantage of an opportunity that's staring me in the face when the other thing that I would like to be doing is kind of not cutting it for me right now. Well, at the end of the day. Somebody is saying, 
I'll shower you with money, and the other path they're going. No, nah, we're going to well, kick weird your, when life we're starts kick your ass screaming the at block. you, right, right, screaming to you. Yeah, yeah. And the thing that you've been going, I've been trying to do this for years, and it's just inert. Yeah. Nothing is happening. And then this other thing is like, I've been telling you, and you're like, uh, yeah. Now if it was now if it was the decision between doing creative and being, um, you know, uh, creatively fulfilled or, or musical or whatever, as opposed to being a, a drug dealer or a murder for hire, you know, that's any decision. But when right. it's something, this kind of creative versus, it's still creative, it's still using your, the, the things that you love, it's just a different path of the same thing. And really, what's the worst that could happen? The worst that could happen is I would, but you I would flub it, you know, but would I really flub it? I would try hard. But but uh, what I'm curious about is... Um, I, think I'm, I think my concern was, do I have the chops or the knowledge to, or the ability to pick up the chops that I need quick enough to make it fly? And that's Oh, really? I, so you were into doing it. I see, I thought maybe more of what it was was like, I don't want want to let go of this. Like there was I'm some a of that. Pitbull on this. I was going to be a guitarist in a band and there, do this. That was a thing, big part of it. And I'm not done. That was a big part of it. But then I read this interview with Hartley Peavy where he said, you know, the thing that kind of was a stumbling block for me in the beginning was is that why would anybody buy an amp from me? Anybody could do this. And then after I was into it for a while, it struck me that if anybody could do this, everybody would be doing it, and they're not. So that means. Everybody can't do it, so I was wrong about that. And when I read that, I went, "That's exactly one of my fears." It's like, well, anybody could do that. Yeah, but we we all as human beings overlook our strengths, hmm. and we do it all the time. And if you think about it, like every every single one of you guys in the chat will relate to this if you really think about it. You have things in life where people on the regular look at you and go, "How are you able to do that?" And you're going, what do you mean? Like, well, you can do it. It's easy. You just do the stuff, right? But then we also know, all of us know other people <laughs> that have skills. And when we look at them, we're going, Steve, how in the fuck did you do that? And then you're going, well, you can do it too. Like, it's easy. Yeah, yeah. It's... We think we have, we make, we make this mistake of thinking that the things that come easy to us are easy to everyone, Right. But then we don't do the same thing when we're looking at other people. Like we right. marvel at other people like, man, you're gifted with, you know, uh, I, I think, design or you're gifted I think, with technique. I think, my, or... I, think my, I think my strength is just like I'll get myself into a predicament and then figure out my way out of it. That's a skill set, man. That's a skill set. And not everybody has that's that. That's what really sort of got me. That's what really got me sort of through the initial stages of doing this thing this is the hell is this when after i showed the prototype to people then it became time to design an actual product and i had no engineering chops no mechanical engineering chops so i had a friend help me figure out how to make a chassis and Another friend that turned me on to a place that did sheet metal fabrication. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I want it like this. And, and I basically was a very rough drawing. And, and I said, this is a really rough drawing. And he goes, oh, people give us rough shit all the time. And then we work out all the details. We'll, we'll kind of help you along with that. And I'm like, okay, great. So I gave them this idea. And then they came back and said, okay, well, we can do this and blah, 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 blah. You should probably do, you know, sort of guided me along. And so what was made... that? Was that in and of itself? Was that um, a revelation where you're like, oh, wait a minute. I can actually be more of an idea guy. And then I can get engineers to come in in the back end and kind of proofread my shit. That was like, oh, you mean you'll not only Here's make, my math. Okay. You'll, you'll not only, you'll all not only do this, make this for me, but you'll, you'll, kind of school me and how to make it the right way. Yeah. 
as long as your design isn't too screwy. And if I made something too screwy, they would say, well, that's, that's okay. But you know, once you do this, then, then these pieces are gonna crash into each other. You gotta like design in the tolerances. Well, how do I do that? Oh, we'll take care of that. Did you have any uh, particular uh, folks that you talked to in this journey that you remember as like kind of pivotal that helped you out in that way? No, no, I just, I just little I just, bits from everybody. Yeah, you because the with? first, the first guy was like, really, yeah, we can do this. We can help you along with this and blah, blah, blah. And we'll do all this stuff. Well, yeah. it turned out they really didn't do all of that stuff. They, they were capable of doing it, but they also would just like disappear. What entity was this? Who was this? I don't, what entity? Yeah. Who, oh, who were these guys? I don't even remember the name oh, of them okay. now, right. but, um, but I gave them a drawing for this chassis, which this is the first production chassis well, for the for the I just want to say real quick hi Amanda and hey oh Robert. you're here okay great I love seeing both you guys here all right you guys yeah I was I was wondering R what you, Robert you were going to show was, was one of my students back in Colorado he's oh, cool. one of the coolest human beings on the planet and Amanda is one of the coolest human beings on the planet well thanks too. thanks everybody for hanging out I yeah. always I always love to, to see did you. the Bills win Robert's a massive Bills fan. <laughs> <laughs> He's Bills Mafia for sure. <laughs> so I had a, I, I gave him this sketch and he said, okay, this all makes sense. And so my idea was to make a chassis with as many pieces all uh, unified as possible. So it only needed a back cover, a bottom cover, and a front panel. Okay. And once they, they, they made it and they brought it to me, and I said, this is all, this is all great, except <laughs> backwards. <laughs> I didn't put, I didn't draw in the hardware because I didn't know how to draw hardware. I just oh. said, you'll put the hardware here and here and here and here. And I showed him on the drawing. Yeah. And he went, okay, well, the guy who programmed the machine program it, programmed it as a mirror image. Sure. Of the drawing I gave him. Yeah. And That's understandable. so they gave me this sample. Now, why this has, why this has all this padding on the side? It's not this this chassis that was like one of the prototype chassis. We actually use it as a, as a jig. I love it. It was repurposed. Uh, yeah, a, a chassis assembly jig. I have a picture of it. Oh um, man, they won, Robert! Right on, man. You gotta jump through some tables. Where, here it is. <laughs> That's right, Amanda. You're a Niners fan. That's right. I remember that. Well, hey, man. I'm a Broncos diehard, and we actually finally won a game. So can we can we see that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll. I'll... Okay. Wait a minute. You can just we leave need the... us off of here. You can just leave it on there. Right? Okay. Uh, okay. Can you cover your eyes, Steve? So, can you see underneath, what, what head is that? That's what a chassis? deliverance head. It's a deliverance. Yeah. And it's sitting on top of that It's chassis. sitting on top of that chassis. The, 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 <laughs> the padded size worked out perfect as a, as a building jig for the chassis. That's so hysterical. We, so, we have a couple of those that we, that we use. As the, My only the, question is, why in the hell don't you have a protector on your phone? I took it off so that I could sit it on this stand for the oh, show. Oh, okay. All right. So, a normal everyday life? Uh, yeah. You actually protect the thing? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, Amanda. <laughs> totally. Well, I grew up there. I've been a Broncos fan since 1986. I'm not going anywhere with it. Uh, everyone wonders... <laughs> um, so... Making music was the, uh, they, they give you what, 10 orders? Yeah. And, and that was enough to kind of put this into production. Yeah. And so um, 10 orders probably isn't enough. I mean, how do you do that when you're brand new and you're like, where do you get the parts? Like, well, see. You, See that's how do that's you do what, it? That that's what you're not ready to incorporate. You're not ready to become. No, no. That's why I did it out of my apartment because I wasn't, I wasn't getting investment money to go, 
rent a commercial space and hire people and invented right. tooling. I did it just, I just totally You're did it. You're hand wiring it. everything yourself, right? No, no, I didn't hand wire anything myself. Oh, so you were smart. I hired a guy. Oh, dude, that's awesome. To do the wiring part, because I hated that part. And um, I just wanted to see it done. So I showed him how to, to do all that. But the, the guys that... The guys that made the chassis were funny because they 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 fabricated the thing backwards. So that if you look on the the back panel, the AC power cord is over here. Everything else is symmetrical. The the impedance selectors, the output jacks, the input jacks, and the stereo mono switch there, those are all symmetrical. But the AC power and the fuse are here. They were supposed to be over here. And the power supply capacitors are here. They were supposed to be over here. And so, miraculously, the way the boards were designed and the way the wiring layout was, we could build it backwards. So the first 25 or 30 that we made, we were already really, really late going to production. And I looked at it, and we waited and waited. And finally, these chassis arrived. And I'm like going, we're screwed. So I thought about it overnight and I went, you know what? We can just build it backwards. And on the front, it's all symmetrical, so it didn't yeah. matter. Yeah. All it meant was the AC cord and the fuse were going to be on the opposite side of the chassis on the back. And none of, none of the stuff that was going on inside mattered yeah. because it was all just a mirror image of what it was. So we built the first 20, 25 units a mirror image and the next one that came out everything was back to normal yeah but we went ahead and did it that way i mean that's the thing that you could do Bananas, when you're man. doing everything thumbnail like that is you could sort of get away with that and um, so that's what i did and uh and then away we went and then i started learning about purchasing and pricing and lead times and that's what led to this thing with the capacitor. Somebody answered, oh, are you going to talk about capacitor? Yeah, we are. And I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> because when I made the prototype, like I said, I, I used um, surplus parts from a local electronics store. Those two big blue capacitors here. They're massive, dude. Those uh, have a date code of 1973 on them. Oh, my God. Now, okay. and those were from Those were from sitting in this surplus warehouse uh, for 10 years. Wow. And they were originally used in the Fender PS400 bass amp. That, those two. Yeah. And they're, they, were, they weren't used, they were new. They were unused Fender surplus stock. So they're stock. new old stock, right. Fender surplus stock, and you are putting them in this prototype in 1989. Uh, 88. 88. Yeah, and I had to reform so them. 15 years later. I had to reform them in order to use them. Wow. So they're... They're, so they're I took of... these old capacitors and reformed them and put them in there and then built a prototype with it. And then I designed, I ordered capacitors from uh, AVX or uh, I forget the name of the company, Aerovox. Um, I ordered those same kind of computer grade big filter caps for the power supply from Aerovox. And they took my order and then on the week that they were supposed to be delivered, they pushed it back six weeks. Uh, and like, you can't do that. And they go, oh yeah, we can, we do it all the time. Just look at the, look at the, the terms on the PO. They're like, With, welcome to the business. Yeah, Mr. yeah. Fryer. So I yeah. learned about that. And so Bend I went over. back to the surplus place <laughs> to see if they had any more of these. And they had a hundred of them. And I bought them. And I successfully Wait, same reformed. surplus uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, house. No, that same you got part. From. Yeah, the same yeah. part. They had a hundred more in stock. I bought them all. Okay. I took. Uh, there were a hundred plus. I bought them all. I reformed them all. Two of them, two or three of them, didn't pass. Didn't pass. Yeah. All the rest of them did. Yeah. I put them in the first fifty units that we shipped, and. Like I said, at the top of the show. So these are this early 70s capacity. 72. Uh, well, uh, yeah, they have the, uh, um, did I, I gave, didn't I give you the picture? Show, no, I didn't give you the picture showing no, the No, you code. showed me on your the, phone. Yeah, yeah, they have the day code of 1971 or two on it. Hey, you know what? Uh, we, we did a little video uh, earlier this Yeah, yeah, evening. let's play that. 
uh, about you reforming the caps and this <laughs> and the reason why yeah. is because uh, guys, if if you weren't uh, tuned in earlier, um, we're talking about the prototype, the prototype number one of the twenty one fifty power amp, and uh, Steve built it out. It's in all original with the original with the original tubes in it that were in it at the time. So it was as you said, it was proof of concept. Right. When it was finished, pack it away in a box. This hasn't been fired up since eighty nine. Eighty nine, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> no matter what, you know, when Steve pulled it out of storage, he had to, okay, we need to bring it back up, right? So you reform the caps. Right. All right, so we're going to look at a video. Well, I wanted to see if I could reform them before having to replace them. Uh, and I suspected oh, that I would be able to, but I wasn't sure. Um, okay, so we got a little video. It's about five minutes long, guys. All right, All right, what's, what's going, going on? on? Well, um, we've got the, the original 2150 prototype up, and we'll talk about the details of it uh, later on the show, but... Which is like in 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right now I'm reforming the capa capacitors. I'm not changing any filter capacitors. I'm reforming the existing ones. So we're up to 300 volts on the power supply now, uh, which, which just means we're halfway there. Uh, so I'm monitoring voltages all over the place. I'm monitoring the AC voltage that's coming in to the AC power. Um, so I'm doubly monitoring it and controlling it from Big Bertha up here. Mm -hmm. And this is the this is the voltage meter. That's the voltage coming right out of the outlet going in. And this one's telling me the voltage after the power switch after the fuses, you know, so I'm getting a real accurate read of the voltage going directly to the power supply. And then um, I'm reading the power supply voltage here and the charging current to the filter capacitors here. And why I'm monitoring the charging current is because when you reform capacitors, how you know how well they're reforming is what happens to the charging current as you're bringing up the voltage. What usually happens is it will, the voltage will go up and the charge current will go up. And as the cap reforms, then the charge current will drift down. Mm -hmm. And how mm -hmm. quickly it drifts down gives you an indication of how quickly the capacitors are reforming. Okay. These, this amp has not been turned on since 1989. We built it, ran, went into production, didn't need to listen to it anymore. It was just, we, we built it as a reference, a proof of concept, and then it went into a box, and this is the first time it's getting powered up since then. It's got the original power tubes in it. So you can see uh, we're, we're, and this the current is so low that the meter keeps timing out, but um, we're at five milliamps of charge current. And when I first went up to 300 volts, it was at eight. So it's drifted down three milliamps. So three milliamps is nothing, but that's that's just showing you how much residual current the capacitors are pulling, mm -hmm. and um, all the capacitors in the circuit are engaged. And there's some uh, there's some bypass resistors across the secondary filter caps for the screen voltage that tie to ground. So some of this low in the milliamp range current some of this is being drawn by those in fact most of it is probably being drawn by those resistors just being across That's the supply to ground huh. so we're at probably one milliamp of actual charge current <laughs> so i can go up i can go up another 50 volts so you can see it goes up to it jumped up to eight milliamps there for a sec and now you can already see by the the numbers oh, to the right of the decimal point it's drifting down from eight to seven seven and a half so these capacitors are already okay i'm at 350 volts if there's any problem with them we would see this a 10 times higher number than that okay We'd probably see 50 to 100 milliamps of charge current and it would increase as i bring up the voltage but it's not it's dropping down and it's stabilizing so hey, but that steve means i don't have to spend a lot of time on this these are old shouldn't you replace them uh <laughs> no Joe Ducks. Well, they're the original capacitors. That was a joke. They're by reforming the way. fine. They're not leaky. 
Um, you know, you can you can look at the, around the seals and see that they're not leaky. I uh, put them on the capacitor meter, and they're reading the proper capacitance within the 20% tolerance that they normally operate at. And we'll talk a little bit more about the main filter capacitors, why it's even more hilarious that they're in as good a shape as sure, they are. Sure, sure. Okay. Because they have no right to be. Right, right. So we'll I'm get just to gonna, that in the show. I'm going to start just jamming this up. The total voltage is going to be 600, and it were four, so we're two thirds of the way up. All right. And now we're we're up to 13 milliamps. And again, if I measure across these resistors, I'll probably find out that most of that current is is right there. Mm. Um, but still, we're seeing it. We're seeing it drop down to 12. So it's going to drop down another milliamp or two. Okay. And I'm really not going to wait for it. I'm up at 400. The transformer is cold. The filter caps are cold. The downstream filter caps are all cold. They're not. They're not warming up because the amount of reforming that's going on is not significant enough to cause them to get warm. Okay. So uh, we're going to be out of here in a few minutes. See, look, we're down to ten milliamps now. We were up at fifteen, and now we've already drifted down to wow, ten, fast. going on nine. Yeah. So we're in really good shape here. Right. I'm going to throw this up on the bench run full power out of it. We've got the original GE 6550s that were in it when it was first built. So those are going to go back in and I'm going to just put it up on the bench to make it work and then we'll play through it in the studio. All right, great. All right. Sayonara. All right, bye. One of the funny things that was that was going on when I started the reforming process is that the current was way, way too high. And I thought, okay, I have to replace these. There's obviously a dead short, even though they're reading good. No, they can't be dead short and reading good at the same time. But when I was sort of looking around, I was like, wait a minute, the output transformer wire is, is, is on the, fil the power tube filament lug. Why is it there? And it, apparently for some reason I had 30 years ago, unsoldered those two leads and just tagged them back on. Maybe I was doing a measurement or something and forgot about it. Yeah. And one of the leads fell off and landed on another lug. And that's where all the current draw was. When I put it back to the room, it was like, oh, wait a minute. These capacitors are forming way better than they have any right to. Now they're 50-year-old capacitors, for crying out loud. I and, love that so much. And just before we left the shop to come here, I had it all reformed, I had it up and running, all the voltage checked right where they're supposed to be, and I ran it up to full clip, and I'm like, there's no ripple in here. So they're, those capacitors are perfectly good, and, and uh, that was the experience that uh, we encountered when we used those for the first production amplifiers. Those amplifiers are still out there working fine, and very, very few of them ever got replaced. So uh, that, and this this is one of the ones that Vernon had. Uh, yeah, he would have had one of those. He would have had the red. Do you one, know? Right? Do you remember how he, like, how did he wind up procuring one of those? Oh well, that was uh, one of the guys that make. Because he's on the East Coast. One of the guys that at making music in 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 uh, Chicago, was uh, worked with him. Bought him. You know, he was a regular customer of that shop in that area. He was specialized in PRS guitars and you know vintage amps and this and that and so he already had a relationship with with those guys um so when the rack things really started taking off it, it was at the same time that we entered the game and so we were the new kids on the block at the same time where this whole new concept of amplification was happening and the uh the amazing thing was that the first time i went to a nam show and i and i ran into randall smith who I was already buddies with because I was a warranty repair service station for Mesa Boogie when I was at Valley Arts. And he was like going, you know, I just got to hand it to you. You're like, you're like eating our lunch and you're doing it because you put 
the, a presence and depth control on the amp. You put basically voicing controls on the amp and all of my customers say they didn't want that. And here you go do it and you just, you eat our lunch. Uh, and I'm like, I I'm sorry, Randy. I didn't really mean to do that. It just, it, that's just the way it worked out. That's how I felt the, the, the amp would be the flexible enough for a variety of players to get different sort of behaviors out of this amp. And I didn't want the amp itself to color the sound so much. Like other, the other manufacturer was really trying to make it sound like a guitar wow. amp power section. And that's that was like, probably what got you over though. That's what got me over because that's what we, I understood right out of the gate that there was two applications for this power amp. One was, that it was going to be in a rack system with reverbs and delays and compresses and EQs and blah, 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 buffers and miles of wire that were all going to suck dynamic range out of the, out of the signal path. And the power amp would be in the unique position of being able to restore some normalcy back to the feel and, and, and dynamic, uh, behavior of a rack system, make right. it more organic sounding. As as opposed to make it making it more compressed and sludgy and stuff, you, that's the opposite way I thought that it needed to go. But that's so that was happening with what slaving a heads power into power amp is supposed to be. Let's the well, head but do we all didn't that. know that. We just knew that we were slaving heads into into non-reactive loads, into EQs and processors and blah blah blah. So all okay, of this let me negative ask you a question. Stuff, all this negative stuff was happening with regard to slaving amps. And the, right. other, and the other thing that was happening, if you were slaving an amp, you were using a preamp, which had no power amp that had no ability, since you okay. didn't have the ability to add dynamics to the preamp, the power amp needed to do that. Okay, questions. Uh, first of all, I want to laugh at BMO. That's a great costume. And I also want to acknowledge Scott. I wish I was full of pizza, so good on you. Cheers. Um, Amanda made a <laughs> prime rib tonight. Excellent. And she looks like Bjork. Um, and Rob bought sandwiches off the internet. That's pretty rad. Okay. Um, so here's my question to you. Yeah. You ready? Uh, no. Okay. Because when I was in, uh, I would like to, I would like to try the, the, the Cadillac. Oh, you need to do that. I can't, I can't because I'm going to have to drive home. Um, oh, there's a question. Okay. All right. Um, all right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to find it, Steve, but I have the question for you. Where's your question? Uh, yeah, we have two different ways of, of looking at the chats and mine has a significant delay on it. So I'm kind of behind. Okay, Joe on this. Well, I'm going to just ask you my question. Yes, sir. Ask me. So when I was in, into the rack world, I was just using preamps. Oh, this okay, never mind. I'm going to have this, Okay. Is this what you had then? Well, I did Lafroy and the coffee liqueur. Is and that exactly it, okay, what you just so did? Okay, so I got what you got. And I'm going to drink some water first. Okay, continue, please. Okay. Thank you. What I never did was I never ran the head into a load and did that whole thing. So what I'm wondering... I was big on that. Okay. So maybe Dave was talking about... I mean, I know those those early loads had to have... I mean, they weren't reactive. No, that's right. They were right. just resistive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they probably kind of felt like shit. Mm -hmm. So it probably makes more sense to me where Dave is talking about, okay, we actually do want the power amp, the underlying power amp of a rack system to recover some of that feel. So yeah, I'm the, thinking of it like in modern times, like, look, we get the top part right. And okay. then the, the power amp has no bearing. And on here's that. where the theory and reality clash. Okay. The reality is by dint of being a good tube power amp that interacts with the speaker that you plug it into, it by default adds back reactive behavior, even though the head is being loaded, slaved by a non-reactive load. So you still get, this is the way the power station works. The power station, you're, if you put the switches on flat, it's not reactive. So you can put your head 
into the power station, into a speaker cabinet, and mysteriously, it somehow feels reactive even when you set it what people consider flat. It's not flat, it's just non-reactive only with regard to the reactive load portion of the power station. There's still a reactive component between the power amp and the speakers because it's a tube power amp and speakers and tube power amps interact with each other in a reactive way, the same way a reactive load does. It's actually really, the speaker is the reactive load. Right, exactly. Right? That's so why we in, like the way So in a sound. rack system where you slave a head that's into a non-reactive load and go through a bunch of processors, how the sound recovers some feel and a, a dynamic quality is just by the fact that it's a two power amp plugged into a speaker cab and that's what people didn't understand at the time and I did so when I made it all put it all together you played it went oh that's working for me where Lukather and, and EVH and a few other people were using the HH power amps yeah. tonally they sounded very good and the HH were solid state right <clears throat> big high powered solid state power amps with very stiff power supplies tonally they sounded good but from a reactive point of view when you put the 25 150 next to the H and H and switch between the two of them the H and H could knock down walls but the 2150 with the same rig would jump in your lap and hug you, you know, and that was the, really the difference. Because it was a guitar-centric power. Because amp. there was a reactive component in there that right. was that was defeated by the use of a solid-state power right. amp. Right. Scott, so, it's your birthday, man. And the same thing was true of a preamp. The preamp would be the equivalent of a, a slaved head with a non-reactive load. It would be kind of stiff, and the speaker combination with the tube power amp would be the unstiffener. Yeah. So it worked both ways very right. well. Right. That's what got us over. And the problem with the the Mesa power amps, which was they had so many power tubes in them, and Randy's idea was, well, we're, we're pulling all this current through the power supply, so we want to make sure that we don't have too much ripple, so we put more filter caps in it, and it's a solid-state power amp-centric concept that you use a ton of tubes and then you use a ton of filtering to manage all the extra current those tubes pull and that stiffens everything up mm -hmm. and he tried to compensate for that by just adding more low in response that made it tubby the way the 2150 fixed all that was use the minimum number of tubes the minimum amount of filtering that you would need and accentuate the dynamic feedback between the speaker and the power amp then it comes alive and that was the difference it just had a more lively realistic feel under your fingers than anything else and that's what got it over. everything you build feels that way to me guys you are killing it in the chat you're making me laugh so hard amanda <laughs> What am I missing? A lady does not comment on loads. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Uh, it's Scott's birthday, man. Scott Brockway's birthday? Yeah. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday, friend. That is awesome. That's probably why you're full of pizza. That's something that I would do on my birthday. Cheers. I'm going to try this. What is this? Yeah. Um, what am I drinking here? Uh, this is Lafroy in this coffee liqueur that uh, I've never seen before uh, in my life. But if you get the balance right... It actually works. Which Ooh. most Lafroig centric cocktails are horrid. This one actually works. You know, that's that's like a black Russian without the extra junk in it. <laughs> um, God, you guys are funny. The the chat on the show just I always have to read. I, I always myself have a, from I dying. always have a difficult time. I'm watching the chat on my phone. So You're I welcome, can, Scott. So I can see it clearly close to me, but it's behind the one on the monitor, which is oh, about... Oh, really? So I, I, you're usually on top of it more than I am. Um, uh, Nico-chan has a question that I haven't seen. And yeah, I can't just, see it. Um, Mock. Oh, I thought you said you had a question. Yeah, no, that's I what I thought. Same question I thought. Oh, 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 okay. Who, so, who's it from? So Nico-chan and Mark Hamster have the same question. All right, but now the important question that has been nagging me all night, when and why did the power switch change from yellow to green? Uh, yeah, that's I can tell you exactly. Um, the It's orange, and I just bought that out of a box at a surplus place. And then when I started oh shit i gotta learn how to do purchasing i gotta contact switch suppliers which switch suppliers should i use so 
I go to music stores and look at all the power switches that are on products that are out there going, nope, 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 nope. They're using that. No, I don't want to use what anybody else is using. That's out. I don't want toggle switches. Screw that. Toggle switches look cute on the front, but mechanically they're very bad on the back end. I don't think they look cute on the front. Well, I mean, the the, the vintage amp thing, you know, like on the Sound City, the toggle switches look good on the front. There's toggle switches on a vintage Sound City? Yeah. No, not small, not mini ones. You're just talking about. I'm talking about the big okay, toggle switches, sorry. the big bats. I've been drinking. They the look cool on the front mm -hmm. of the amp, but usually the 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 mechanical electromechanical part behind the panel that you don't see, are at that time was very very poor and unreliable, and I didn't okay. want to have anything to do with that. All right. So I was looking around, and um, the the nicest ones that I saw out there were the ones on the Rivera amps, but they were red. And so, but I like the way they look. And so I got, I contacted the supplier for that switch. And did you find that out through uh, uh, this was before the internet? So I, yeah. I contacted them, I drove by their place, got a catalog, and I'm looking through and they go, Oh, they got this beautiful emerald green one, and nobody's I'll take using that, that, and nobody's using that. And we used it so hard, so often that. These days, if anybody uses an emerald green power switch, I get to tease them about it. And they usually say, well, we were inspired by your switch, you know, so. Like, Damn uh, straight you were. But I just, that's what, I just thought it was the greatest. This switch, if you look at it really closely, it's an ugly switch. It's really rectangular and kind of. Well, you know what was funny camera. was uh, when, when Steve was reforming the caps, it wasn't lit up. And then as it started to come up, we went, hey, look. Yeah, it's starting, starting to dance. Starting to it's like, yeah. it's alive! It's got a neon bulb in there and it's just kind of flickering. And it, it was the, Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah, it's a funky switch. In fact, all the switches are really funky and I didn't like them. But I like the idea of using a solid, reliable rocker switch. And then I found this company that made not only a solid, reliable rocker switch, but a great looking one too. So Plug that bitch in next to you, that Stratocaster. Oh, well, all right. Let's make some noise with it. So, it's so proof we're not going to we're not going to we're not going like to go through the stream and do all that silly stuff. We're, we're just, just gonna, showing that it actually works. We're just going to show that it actually works. And and we didn't even test it before we. I just put it on the bench and made sure that it put out full power, and that was it. So this has the been bias played on it. since 1989, y'all. And the bias on it was um, a preset voltage. It didn't have a bias control on it. So it's biased the way it was. When it so was the year the Berlin first, Wall came down was built. the last time yeah. you turned this yeah, sucker baby. on. Okay, there's signal coming through it. The GPDI, we're yeah. good. Yeah, I just kind of, before you do anything over there, I just want to make sure how I got it set. So we're going through the A do channel. Do I fire this up? Well, let's do this. This is kind of like my default. Okay. Oh, one of the things I'm going to show you a picture of it is inside so uh, remember i made this in 1988 so that's four years and, and it's got the presence and depth controls that's f before the pv four years before pv filed their patent on their brilliant idea of a resonance control which is actually the this depth. circuit of the depth yeah, control right so i just set it the way i normally like it and let's put this on zero and go ahead and hit that switch. Ooh, that made that little click to let you know that it works. And now I've just gradually turn the volume. All right, I have a little bit too much brightness here. Is that obnoxious? 
push the power up section in the GPDI. A hey guys, a uh, little hot. Uh, um, is it distorting on the feed? Or is the yeah, we might be black. Well, we're kind of far away from the mic. We're not playing very loud in here. This is a, a custom shop 55, right? 56. 56. It's a GC 56, which means so two it's got a flatter, flatter radius. Flatter radius, bigger frets. It's just one of the better straps. <laughs> Trebly sound. He used a fair amount of gain, but he had this really. <laughs> Hold on. Did you see the birthday boys comment? No. Yeah, it sounds good and simultaneously like dog shit. <laughs> okay. Is that because I sound like dog shit? I don't know. It's just a. <laughs> John's saying it's clipping, so probably the mic is just distorting. All right, well, I'll turn. I'll leave that up and I'll turn this down. How's that? I can get more overdrive. Yeah, now. Scott's saying it's because the mic is distorted. So that's, is it okay? Is it better now? I don't know. Punk era guy. Okay, that was the uh, Bimo gave us the pumpkin emoji. That was the, the turd emoji. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, 
first time I heard that, I thought, wow, these guys are real musicians. They're just like, yeah, they do all the psychedelic stuff and the distortion and all the crazy shit, but when they're doing that, well, to like, me, that was the musicians. That was the first time. Uh, well, but at this volume, check out the how, check out the feel of this. All right. The, And by the way, the slap May cabinet. I have a pick. The slap cabinet that's back here. This is the cabinet I had when I was originally. console and yeah we were clipping a little bit so now we're at the same speaking voice as the sound and I still think it feels good but it should be yeah, loud really now that it's not clipping it, it really does no I did bring another power load home from the shop today. What serial number is it, Steve? This is serial number 666. Oh. I always do serial number 666. Don't ask me why. I just do. Oh, and by the way, that riff I was playing a little earlier, that was the Stranglers. Oh, it was. Um, Band of Gypsies is still my, your favorite Hendrix album. Dude, that is one of the most... Pardon me, unfuck with the ball records in the history of recorded music. Yeah. And, band yeah. and it's so funny how uh, I always heard that, um, like, they had to rush, get it out. Keep talking, I'll be right back. Uh, sorting through all the stuff from those Fillmore tapes. And it blows my mind, you know, since they, they released everything by now, that when you really listen back to everything, you're like, they really got it right. Like, everything they put out on that original Band of Gypsy stuff was like, that was the record that needed to happen. Um, so, oh God, I love Band of Gypsies. I need to listen to that again. And I need to listen to Bridge of Sighs again. Uh, how's it go? came out, I had a real to real tape machine and I bought it on real to real. I met one guy in my life, um, beautiful cat, uh, oh shoot, I forget his name, who was actually at one of the nights, went to two shows, uh, Band of Gypsies at the Fillmore. I love these kinds of stories. Like, I try and track <laughs> down people. Like, you're actually one of them. You actually saw Hendrix with your own goddamn eyes, you know? The closest I ever got to him uh, in terms of like uh, colleagues was uh, hanging out with Brian Auger. 
I got uh, to hang out with because Brian was doing mm-hmm. records with a good friend of mine and uh, my friend's going away party. He was moving back to Lyon, uh, France, and uh, Brian came. And uh, I was actually like angling, like I want to play with Brian. I wanted to play in his band, but <laughs> basically because of the Hendrix mm-hmm. Association. But man. It was so cool. I cornered Brian and we sat at a picnic table together and I talked to Brian for a good hour and just picked his brain about Hendrix. Because guys, I don't know if you know, but um, when Jimmy flew uh, to London with with Chaz Chandler, the first thing Chaz did was take him to uh, a Brian Auger gig and have Jimmy sit in. So Brian was the first guy and Brian's band was the first thing that Jimmy was doing in London, mm. introducing him to the London scene, like, let's go have him sit in with Brian. Mm. And so he got, you know, Brian was his first kind of musical buddy there. And mm. so it was super, super cool to mm. talk to Brian mm. all about that mm. stuff, playing cool. with Jimmy and hanging cool. with him and stuff. So you can't play Hendrix, but you can play Trower. Well, I don't know, man. So yeah, if you can play close. close. If, you, if you can play, if you can play Trower, then you just pick a little lighter and work on your left hand dexterity a little bit and you can play Hendrix. I wanted to just like, we talked a lot about the prototype and we showed you what it looked like inside and stuff. But the next thing that happened, this came, I built this in 1988, used it as a proof concept, started producing amplifiers off of it. And then in 1989, we started shipping the first 2150s. By the middle of 1989, I started becoming really aware that I wanted to refine the design and get it perfect for a rack system where it would do all the sounds great, not just the high gain sounds. And that became the next revision of the 2150, which this is the prototype for. And um, the picture that's on the placeholder for this episode, you can see, uh, you can see that right in between the knobs and the fuse holders here, there's a T and an X. And what that was for was I was experimenting with the phase inverter design on this. So on the original 2150, it had a 12AX7 for the input amplifier for both channels mm-hmm. and a separate long tail pair phase inverter for each channel. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem with that was, besides that the phase inverter didn't have enough headroom to really push a pair of 6550s to full output before starting to collapse. And in order to get it to get all the way to full output without collapsing, I had to bias the tubes a little on the hot side. Yes. All right. So in order to, to solve that problem, I redesigned the phase inverter. The other problem with using just three preamp tubes is that having the first one 12x7 to be a triode amplifier for each channel mm. is the crosstalk between inside the tube between the two channels was significant enough that a stereo reverb image would narrow because of the bleed between the triodes within the 12x7 of each channel. And that was probably something that no other guitar power amp builder was thinking about. Was the actually. Cross-talk. The, the 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 Mesa power amps and every other power amp out there, especially the compact ones that, that use three twelve AX sevens, where the input stage is is each triode of a single twelve AX seven is shared between the two channels, has that crosstalk problem. Narrows the stereo image by a significant amount. And I, once I realized that, I went I was actually at Bradshaw's shop, and he was going, listen to this. When I listen to the H&H, I got a really wide stereo soundstage. When I listen to the 2150, the feel is better, and the dynamic range is better, and the sparkle is better, but the reverb sounds smaller. And I'm like, you know what? You're absolutely fucking right. Uh, So I went back. Really? That wasn't something that you just did from the jump? No, because I didn't really think about it in those terms. I was thinking about power and delivery and reliability and blah, 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 blah. And then when Bradshaw actually had a sophisticated enough rack system where he could demonstrate how important the crosstalk issue would be, I just went, absolutely, we got to address that. So Mm. this version became uh, 
one of the guys, uh, one of you posted um, on the comment section before we started this episode, what led you to the cathodyne phase inverter? This is what led me to the cathodyne phase inverter. What I could do was use 112AX7, that would be the input amplifier stage and the phase inverter, if you use a cathodyne phase inverter, within the 12AX7 and get that nice sparkly sound, and then use a 12AT7 after it as a, bo as a booster, a voltage amplifier, to boost the output of the phase inverter significantly, really drive the output power tubes to full output and give you a nice thunk and thwack, right? So I built the first prototype that way, and I took it back over to Bradshaw, and I said, okay, check out this. And he played one chord with the reverbs and delays all going, and he went, ah, oh, yeah, 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 that's it. So that, that was the end of it. The only, the only the thing about the, the T and the X here is the voltage amplifier after the phase inverter, I tried it with a 12AX7 and a 12AT7 and a 12AU27. U7, and in this particular iteration, I was used comparing the T 12 AT7 to 12 AX7. I ended up settling on an AU7 because I didn't need more gain than I needed. I didn't need more headroom than I needed. I needed the best overall tone, and the U gave me that. The AX was too gainy, too bright, too noisy, and the T was too stiff. So mm. I settled on the U. And of course, each of those configurations wasn't just a matter of switching the tubes, but biasing the, the, the triodes in those tubes so that they did the optimum job with the minimum of downside sonically and noise and performance. That's how I ended up with the U. And then, so this became the proof of concept for the same power amp design with more dynamic range and better stereo separation, which became the next iteration of the 2150. Uh. Yeah. Yo, I mean, how locked in did did uh, Buddy Miles. did did Buddy Miles and Jimmy have to be to pull that off? I mean, those guys were in sync. They were like locked in. That was a great feel. And Billy Cox, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Billy Cox was just like laying it down. He wasn't trying to be too distorted or too, no. too wasn't trying to hog the stage. He was anything. like a was true bass player. Laying it down, laying down the foundation. Here's where it is. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, we're getting towards the three hour mark. Hope you guys had as much fun putting up with. <laughs> all the nonsense that we had to slog through to get to this stuff as we did slogging through all this nonsense to get to the good stuff <laughs> and um uh you know i always feel like are we gonna are we gonna have a good enough show that, that people are gonna in, enjoy and, and and get some valuable information and just have a laugh and and listen to some good stuff and have some fun and i hope you did and we we always uh, love having you here. I we, always just wish it could be like more of an interactive format. You know what I mean? Where everybody could like come on the show or something. We could. It's. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like it's so great to see everybody who comes on here. Yeah, awesome, Amanda. I'm really glad you came on. You were able to make it too. Obviously. Um, yeah, well, we we talked about that one time. Is there? It would be great if we could. If if somebody wanted to wanted to just like try to spray just, just spray on the comments and like <laughs> and like draw attention to themselves like okay let's just let's give the guy his moment well you know what we uh, could, maybe could do maybe something like uh because we're still on Streamyard and you can bring people on maybe we could have some people who show up regularly like come on for a little bit like just come on we'll talk that would be cool. You know what I mean? That yeah. would be really fun. I, that would be cool. And, and it wouldn't have to be the whole show, so they didn't feel like they had to come on and like, you're on, and like, you're the featured guest. But like, you know, we have so many people who show up every single time, like regularly. It'd be fun to have you, you guys on. We could actually meet you and, and kind find of shoot the shit a little bit. Find out what your favorite drink recipe is. And you can insult us face to face. Sure. It'd be sweet. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That would be awesome. <laughs>
Now, uh, about the next show, we're going to be... Are we going to be two weeks away, or are we going to be not here until we're back? No, I think, I think what we want to do... And actually, you tell me right now, and then they will know. We were talking about doing History of the Pitbulls and doing combos and then heads. That's going to be... We're in. We're at the end of October, right? Yeah. And that means we have November and December to finish out the year. Two weeks out of November, uh, I'm going to be out of town, and so we've got six weeks to finish all the back orders for this year. So, getting, putting together that story and dragging all the stuff out and running through that kind of thing. And I want to do more documentation and okay. kind of follow up and stuff. So like maybe that. we won't do that right away. Maybe we'll do a, you asked for it again. Let's next. do an end of the year kind of like, let's just all get together and, and just hang out. and. We'll and, do that in December. Okay. But, but we, we have, we could take next week off because we've done two in a row. And then we have two more weeks before you go out of town. All right. So we, we can do stuff. Yeah. So we could, uh, we could see how my, how my, uh, my, dermatology surgery went if anybody of you noticed bandages it isn't because Nika chan kicked my ass this weekend although she did she but, did yeah um i went to a I told you that a couple of weeks ago i went to the dermatology they gave me this treatment that made my face blow up well i went back in for a follow-up and there was a, a a mole and a cyst and he says oh yeah well, we'll have to address that and i'm thinking okay in a couple of weeks and he pulls out a scalpel and a a a, a, a syringe and this electric thing for cauterizing uh, a, a, a surgery. And he says, oh, we'll just do it right now. Before I could even open my mouth, he slices a mole off my face and then cuts out a cyst. And then... And Slicing time, and a Dyson. He's, 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 he's poking me with this needle with this, uh, you know, with anesthetic. And then, and then he's cauterizing it with this little thing that looks like a little, a little handheld... <laughs> This sending sparks and smelling burning skin and stuff, and I'm like going, no, no, no! I didn't really want you to. I, too late. He, he already did it. And You're being remodeled. I was being remodeled, and then a couple of other little things where he's got this spray can of liquid nitrogen, <laughs> where he just freezes off if you've got a, like a little skin defect. He just hits it with the spray, and it freezes, burns it off, and I'm like, great. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go do the show with like bandages all over my face. And well, he did, and he's and you know what he said? He said, "Just turn, don't turn that side of your face to the camera." <sighs> that was his response. Great, yeah, with a born director. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So I said, "All right." Well, it was too late. He was already like slicing and dicing. And so by the next show, uh, yeah, it was like a soldering iron. It really was. Yeah, <laughs> we all, we all got to go through it. So so I'm just taking notes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll be doing that soon enough, I'm sure. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and so two weeks to, to, um, to finally clear up the new me, and um, are we going to have anything fun to talk about going forward by then? We might. Totally. Uh, people, are, people are asking about... I think we're going to do two before you go to Japan. People are going to be asking about how it's going with the GPDI. We're getting really close. How are you doing with any new developments? We're getting really close on being able to talk about some of that stuff. What about the Ultra Lead? Yeah, it's coming right along. How long are you going to be in Japan? Uh, about uh, two and a half weeks. Two weeks to two so and a half So you'll be weeks. back at the beginning of December? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll do, we'll do uh, well, depending on the workload at the shop, I think we'll do two apps before you go to Japan. Okay. And we'll cram them in. And then I think we'll do the Pitbull in December. We'll do the two Pitbull episodes, and then we'll be at the end of the year, and we'll do a fun, no-brainer episode. All right, so girls and boys, if you've got any druthers, if you want us to talk about a specific thing, you want to know more about some arcane craziness that nobody has any right to even try to remember, happy to happy to sort of dive into stuff like that. Let us know. Totally. Um, um, any... Uh, you know, if you want to send us love love letters, hate mail, please feel free. And um, I can tell you that we will be back with Gusto in two weeks with whatever it is we're going to talk about. And I'm sure that we're going to be late. And <laughs> I'm going to switch the switcher thing wrong and the sound is going to go... <laughs> 
going to go off and I'm going to play around with the microphone levels a little bit and maybe try to push something else cool down the stream. I don't know what that's going to be, but uh, if you um, if you if if you want to if you if you want to see us uh, with our knickers down, just let us know. <laughs> Uh, what kind of stupid stuff we do that you find the most entertaining and we'll be happy to like be your monkeys on the elephant's back. <laughs> and I that's all that's I got it. to say I about that. Yeah. <laughs> happy Halloween, everybody. Thanks for joining tonight. Uh, I'm going to go eat some food. Are you going to go eat some food? Uh, we are going to eat some We're going to eat some food. Uh, hope you had a good time. Um, and thanks for hanging with us, and you all rule, and we'll see you in two weeks. Peace and love. Take care. All right. Bye.